Okay, we're good. All right, thank you. Call to order the Tuesday, November 17th, 2020 meeting of the Weathersfield Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, Joe, would you call the roll, please? I would accept. I am having trouble opening the uh, the packet with the agenda for some reason. Let me try one more time, and if not, uh, well, I, can I can do it if you want. That's not a problem. Okay, thank yep. you. Uh, Chairman Rich. Yep. I am here. Uh, Mr. Hammer. Yes. Mr. Hughes. Mr. Oikel. He's Mr. Oikel. Uh, he's here. He's on mute. Mr. Dean. Here. Mr. Edwards. Here. Mr. Vieira. Here. Mr. Drake. Here. Ms. Antoniak is not here. Mr. Homicki. Here. That's it. Okay, thank you. So that's that's nine. Everybody will be participating. Um, first item is Old Business 2.1, Continued Public Hearing on Application 2054-20-Z, Town of Weathersfield seeking a zoning text amendment in accordance with Section 101F of the Weathersfield Zoning Regulations for self-storage facilities. And we opened the hearing last time, had some good discussion about it. Peter went back and made some changes to the regulation draft based on those comments and I will ask Peter to basically run through what the changes are. Sure, I can do that. Um, just in summary, you did in your packet, you should have received a, uh, a revised uh, proposed set of regulations dated November 13th of this year. Uh, in summary, um, we made changes in nine uh, different areas uh, to the previous proposal. Um, we revised the uh, definition a little bit of mixed use development. Uh, secondly, uh, we revised the language um, regarding uh, the uh, uses that are permitted in the underlying zoning. Uh, there was a question about the BP zone and in terms of uh, whether residential um, could be permitted in a mixed use development, uh, even though the underlying zone uh, does not uh, permit it. So we clarified that to uh, answer the question. And the, que the answer to the question is no, it would not be uh, otherwise permitted um, if it's not permitted in the under underlying zone. So we clarified that. Uh, number three, we added language um, that uh, allows uh, the commission uh, to grant um, approval uh, for existing uh, adaptive uh, reuse of buildings. Uh, so that the mixed use requirement and the multi-story building requirement do not have to be satisfied in those cases. Uh, number four, uh, we reduced the separating distance between uh, these facilities from 5,000 feet to 1,500 feet, as there was a concern about that. Uh, we added, um, uh, we revised the language for the percentage of the building facade uh, that had to have windows um, and we clarified that so that that only applies to facades that are visible uh, from a public street. So if you've got a rear facade or a side facade and there's no visibility back there, uh, we've eliminated that requirement. Um, number six, uh, we added some language because there was a concern about the garage style doors. Um, so we clarified that uh, you can't do that if it's visible from a public street. Uh, we added some additional screening requirements for uh, truck loading dock areas that might uh, abut a residential property. Number eight, we added language um, that the commission um, can relax some of the building density requirements as an incentive to encourage mixed use. So rather than, uh, uh, we, so we just clarified that, that that's uh, an incentive allowed uh, by the commission if they deem it appropriate. And then lastly, number nine, um, we reduced the parking ratios um, and clarified a little bit about how the parking uh, applies in a mixed use uh, development uh, scenario. Previously, the parking requirement was one space for every 50 storage units. And we've changed that to one space for every 100 storage units. We've made that uh, a lesser requirement. We've also clarified that if there is a commercial component or another residential component, 
uh, those um, uses would have to meet uh, the normal parking standards as well as uh, the self storage would have to meet this new self storage standard. So that um, in a nutshell uh, were the revisions that after going back and listening to the meeting again, uh, we felt addressed um, the, the majority of the concerns uh, that were noted uh, basically two weeks ago at your last public hearing. Okay, thanks. I'd be happy to uh, go through the specifics, but um, that was just a quick summary of the various uh, changes. And your version uh, has those sections highlighted in yellow, so it's clear what sections we revised and which sections stayed the same. Okay, thank you. Do any members of the commission have questions for Peter? Yeah, this is this is David Drake. I have a quick question. Hey, Peter, I wouldn't. I didn't know you were going to go all the way down to fifteen hundred feet. How, how many uh, at fifteen hundred feet? How many can you fit on Southern Highway based on where you're at now? Do you have any idea? Could, could you get three? I know you get two. Could you get three? I'm not sure if you could get three um, because only portions of the uh, Silas Dean Highway are zoned regional commercial. It's basically uh, the half of the Silas Dean Highway south of um, south of Maple. Down to so the I guess I guess in my mind I'm thinking 2,500 feet or 1,500 feet is probably the same thing. We talked. Yeah, about, yeah we talked about 25 at the last meeting, but I yeah. after looking at it, I I knocked it down to 1,500. Um, yeah, it's hard to say. If I mean, know, it sounds like it's the same thing. Basically. I, I think it is. You yeah. might you might be able to squeeze in um, if there was a site available. You might be able to squeeze in another, you know, closer to the Rocky Hill town line. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Fair, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Frankly, that um, was that was my question too. Um, so if you wanted to be safe, you could you could you know knock it up to the twenty five hundred just to be um, extra safe, but. Um, there in, in the also in your packet you did um, get a copy of the slide presentation from the last meeting which has the graphic in there so it might be worth taking a quick peek. Yeah, I, I couldn't tell from that. That's why I mean I you know. It's... Yeah. So the yellow. Yeah, I got you. I can see what you mean. Yeah. Um, so the yellow yeah. is twenty five hundred. Yeah, I mean it, it would be tough unless they were at completely opposite ends of that part of the Silas Dean. Right. Yeah. And even then it might not work. So yeah, I'm not as worried about that as I would have been otherwise. Any George. I guess my uh, my I'm sorry. George was muted too, but uh, Joe. Yes, thank you. My two thoughts. One is, uh, I, I'm just thinking, what's the harm with the 2500? And although it may never happen in a lifetime, does that give us some better protection if we were to somehow rezone one of those existing business districts and maybe not have to worry as much about you know this becoming an issue if we do? rezone somebody. And then I guess the second thought, Peter, is I see that you gave the flexibility in being able to increase the building height and density and just wondering, should we impose some kind of a cap? I know, for example, may increase it not to exceed 25% beyond what's already a ladder than just have it, you know, theoretically limitless. So right now it's 40, 40 feet is the maximum. And the coverage, um, if I remember correctly is, it was in the earlier memo, um, I think it's 50% 50, 50%, but so if you wanted to establish uh, so you're talking about a percentage rather than a number as an idea yeah that's what i was thinking and i don't know what the percentage should be but it just you know we probably want to have some kind of limit you know stop on that whatever it is okay 
it is 50 percent however you do it i just think thank you we're gonna have some peter uh the parking spaces you went to what 100 one um, one space for every 100 units why'd you go that i looked at a number of other communities and i've looked at you know i looked at our existing uh, facilities and in, in terms of uh, how many cars are typically parked there. I think as I noted at the uh, last meeting, um, the Olison Road uh, facility, when um, I looked at it, I think there, there was one vehicle in there. Um, the one at the north end of the Silas Dean Highway, there were uh, four or five. I think that facility has either six or 700 units. So that just seems to makes sense these are not if you've got two or three tenants uh, at the site uh, at any one time that's that tends to be uh, kind of a big number so i didn't want to uh require a, an, an over overly high number of parking spaces given this day and age where some towns are getting rid of their parking uh, requirements altogether um so I, I, yeah based on my research and um uh industry standards uh that's a that's a reasonable number. We also have a one space for every 250 square feet of office. Um, plus if it's mixed use, then there would be additional parking to satisfy the other users as well. So I think uh, given all of that, it's it's a reasonable reasonable number. Okay, acceptable. We also uh, should have received uh, a supplemental um, letter um, from uh, Mark Trahan in a separate email from your packet. And I believe Mark uh, is uh, with us again uh, tonight if, if he wants to um, uh, speak to um, any of that correspondence. Yeah, do you want to, Mark? I'm usually a man of many words. I'm a man of few words tonight. Peter, you're doing a wonderful job. Okay. Uh, Tom and George, I think had questions. We'll go in that order if you still do. Um, yeah, the, this is Tom talking. Um, with regards to uh, the section that uh, uh, gets its um, uh, subsection E of uh, the new section 512, which is uh, number three or item number three in your uh, memo, um, where you reduce the, uh, uh, the location requirements of to, down to 1,500 feet. I kind of echo the uh, uh, concern that uh, Joe and others had mentioned about uh, the reduction below the 2,500 foot uh, amount, but uh, your explanation does seem reasonable. Uh, you know, if, if there's no net effect of uh, going down to 1,500 feet, I don't have objections to that. Uh, my prefer preference would still be in the 2,500 foot uh, uh, arena. The other thing I want to comment on is uh, the the subsection above that, which is D, uh, which uh, provides the commission uh, some flexibility to modify, and uh, I uh, applaud that section uh, because that that does al allow the commission to uh, you know to to vary to some extent the application of the regulations to fit some particular uh, uh, application that uh, uh, where it may be reasonable to do such modifications. Um, my sense is, and and I guess I'm asking you to correct me if I'm if I'm wrong in this, but if that subsection would be invoked, that is the subsection that allows the commission to uh, modify the multi-story and mixed-use requirements. Um, if that uh, subsection is invoked uh, at any future hearing, um, my sense is that 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 the commission must make the findings in one, two, and three, 
uh, D1 and D2, D3 explicit before it can uh, agree to a modification. Is that correct? Yes. Whenever we have a section that uh, you know requires findings, uh, that all should be well documented on the record and uh, discussed um, as part of the approval process that you have made those three findings, um, and therefore your the project is qualified to grant the um, the modification. Okay, that that's that was my uh, sense of uh, of the of the status of that. So thank you for clarifying. That uh, completes my questions. Okay, thank you, George. Did you have something? Yes, I did. Um, I want to be sure that our existing facilities won't be hampered by the new regulations. Uh, in other words, the exemptions and so forth that you just talked about, for example, uh, it can accommodate a, an improvement or revisions or a significant upgrading of our existing facilities. Is that correct? George, um, section, I guess it's in the page four of the, um, of the packet. Uh, subsection Q uh, is the section that would cover uh, our existing facilities. Uh, and if they wanted to expand or if they wanted to add some new buildings on site, uh, the commission, um, there's specific language in here that the um, expansion or new construction uh, would be allowed uh, under a uh, non-conforming uh, provision. So uh, there is language in there that would accommodate and allow um, those facilities to expand and or add some buildings if they uh, ever wanted to do that. And they wouldn't have to meet a lot of these requirements uh, in doing so. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anyone else on the commission have questions for Peter? If not, um, it is a continued public hearing, so I'll invite any members of the public who want to comment on the application to do so at this point. Uh, yes, good evening. This is AJ Fanaro. How are you all? Uh, two weeks ago, I listened very attentively, I think anyway, to what the discussion was, and I thought it was very healthy. And uh, I thank Peter and Mark for putting together these proposals. But I will have to say though, and I am the owner of 1000 Silas Dean, as you know, uh, when I read the second draft of these proposed regulations, uh, they really don't seem to me to be consistent with what I at least heard in the first discussions that the commissioners all had. And I'll be very specific. And you know, one of you all said that Let's not let the great get in the way of the good. And I thought that was a tremendous comment to make, uh, considering this site, my site has been vacant for such a long period of time. And while I've made accommodations and tried to work with the town uh, extensively over the years, every single non self storage transaction that has been proposed to me has fallen apart. And so a year ago, uh, just before this moratorium was put in place, just by way of review, this property was put under contract by me and uh, we were going to close on a self storage. It just seems like everybody wants to do self storage. It seems like this site is designed for self storage and we're trying to force the market perhaps to do something that it really doesn't want to be. And I have to ask the question and it came up in the last conversations, the last meeting that you all had. And I think it was talked about if somebody brought a proposal that was non-mixed use. For example, one of the illustrations that was in the original presentation included a Milford, Connecticut site. Uh, if somebody brought a proposal that had that Milford, Connecticut site or something similar to a redesign, similar to that, that did not have self, excuse me, did not have mixed use, all right? And it's going to be a project, a seven, $8 million project and add tremendous value uh, to the community, would you say no? Because under these proposals, having mixed use to be defined as part of, right in the definition of self-storage as proposed, it's saying it's mixed use. 
And so I just want to make sure I understand because I thought I understood last time the discussion was very healthy with regard to entertaining mixed use as to a possible incentive to something above and beyond, but not such that it would require mixed use and it would prohibit somebody proposing something that did not have mixed use to it. I, I can tell you of the 50% requirement is, is totally impractical and you're saying that that's not going to be a self source uh, facility. Uh, the second comment I have, so that's generally with re regard to mixed use. The second I have is, while I also commend uh, the recommendations last time with respect to having some form of exemption with respect to adaptive reuse, I have to admit though, when I read section D and it says one, two, and three, and it was confirmed on the call tonight that these requirements are mandated before anything can be considered. When I read D, it says the commission may, it said may, it doesn't say these are not part, there's regulations that are proposed are not going to apply. It said the commission may modify the multi-story and the mixed use requirements. And if these things are applied, first of all, it says market demand. Well, certainly nobody who's going to invest $7 million is going to do this without a market demand and knowing what the, what the facility is gonna require. And so I'm not sure why you need that because I think somebody putting up their own money is gonna make, gonna make that decision. Secondly, and number two, and this is, this one is the most kind of surprising to me, where it says site and or building conditions make the site unsuitable or infeasible for other permitted uses in the zone. Well, you, you can drive a truck through that. In my site, I did have trucks driving through that. And so I just don't see any way that gives any teeth to this possible may modify the provision of this because you can put a lot of things on that site and say that it's unsuitable, but this is the highest and best use it appears based upon the empirical data that's shown in the market. The market says this wants to be self-storage and we're more than willing to entertain anybody else that has an interest in this. But unfortunately, it seems like the town has a, re a very big concern about self-storage and I guess at least they did a year ago, but now they've gotten over that because Peter did a great job taking photographs around the state and showing what self storage does look like. And one of those, the, the Milford one, which is very appealing, did not have mixed use. So my question really is, uh, you know, why are we entertaining in saying mixed use has to be mandated and put this in the proposed regulations? And certainly the exemption, and I appreciate the consideration for the adaptive reuse, but I don't see uh, putting these constraints that these criteria say you can't have anything else that's, you know, it has to be unsuitable for anything else and infeasible. Uh, we're just wasting our time here and I'm, I'm wasting my time. And I can tell you that this property, as you know, has been vacant for a very long period of time. All right, you know, if you add it up and I did the quick math, it's costing the town $500 a day, $15,000 a month. And you can do the math over how many years this has cost. Okay, potentially this could be a seven, $8 million site. It can definitely use for self storage. There's been no question about the demand and we're going back and forth. You know, it didn't take a year. I don't know why it did, but it shouldn't have taken a year to figure out that self storage is not orange doors anymore. And so I don't know why we just keep going back and forth with these proposals, let the market be what it should be. And then we should have some type of architectural review and that's fine. Nobody wants to put anything that's not aesthetically pleasing, that doesn't fit along with the community, that doesn't do well for what's visually in front, okay? But to put these arbitrary provisions requiring mixed use, requiring 50%, saying that nothing else is suitable, okay? This is totally impractical and is trying to make a property be what it, you know, what it doesn't want to be, at least in my case. And I think it's costing not only me a significant amount of money, all right. I had tremendous hardship because I had something that was under contract. And, you know, even though I was cooperating over many, many years with the town to be able to do something else. OK, even helping Paul Montaneri get elected again. And uh, but unfortunately, now I'm slapped with something at the last hour when I put something in contract to let it probably be what it wants to be. And I don't think it's fair. It's not fair to me and it's not fair to the town either. I paid over a million dollars in taxes in this property. 
Okay, but if I paid a million dollars, I can tell you the town lost over $3 million. And you're losing $500 a day with this. And so, you know, I think just to sum it up, I think, you know, the gentleman who commented about don't let the great and get it away of the good, um, I'm going to echo that in spades. And so I don't really know why you're doing this. Uh, you know, I can sit and let this property of mine, you know, be vacant for another 10 or 20 years or whatever. But that's not helping anybody. It's not helping me and it's not helping the town. So I really would encourage you all to maybe go back, look at the conversations that you had before, because I thought you were right on target when a lot of you all were asking, why should we, why should we mandate this? And don't let the great get in the way of the good. You know, if you want to have uh, architectural review, I'd be 100% supportive of that. And let that, let that, you know, make sure it fits the community and so forth and aesthetically pleasing. Okay, but to require these arbitrary provisions, uh, you, you just, you're just asking for trouble and you're asking for my site just to sit there for an extended period of time. For so I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has, anything about the market, anything about, you know, what <laughs> you've had, any, anything else about cell storage. I know more than I ever thought I would ever need to about cell storage, uh, but I can tell you my company uh, you know, we've done billions of dollars in financing all around the country. You know, we're in the Brookby Financial, you can see over my shoulder, but my company, I set 28 years ago, and we've put billions and billions of dollars into communities. Uh, if somebody wants to do something else with this site and there's a personal interest, all right, then maybe I'd sell it to them, okay? And if Mark or Peter or whoever have an interest in this, want to do something else, I'll sell it to them. I may even finance that. Uh, but right now, uh, we have something that wants to be what it should be. And uh, I'm really getting to the point, the end of my rope, you know, with the trying to be patient here with everybody. So uh, I'd open up to questions. Anybody has any questions for me? Thank you very much for listening. So is Hi, this is... That, yes, I have. Go ahead, Dave. Rich, my only comment, I'm looking at 3D. Unless I misunderstand it, that's pretty much was written for you. 3D, it says we may modify, which means we can say we don't need mixed use on that property. So I'm not sure what your concern is. Unless I'm missing something, I think 3D was written for you. Yes, you are missing something with all due respect. It says yeah. the commission may modify. May, right. May. Okay, so that's a possibility it may, and that also means may not. The second, please, may I finish, okay. please? Okay, because I am the only one on this call tonight that has a financial interest here. Okay, I'm the only one on this call tonight. I challenge all of you with respect to how much you've paid in taxes. I've paid over a million dollars in taxes here. So I'm trying to be patient, all right? But this property was taken, this, this sale was, was swiped away from me, okay? And I had this property sold. So I think having waited over a year, uh, you know, without speaking up more aggressively, I think I deserve some accommodation for that. The point number two, where it says site and or building conditions make the site unsuitable or infeasible for other permitted uses in the zone. You can drive a truck through that, okay? And so really, what is the intent? Is this, you know, is this a wolf? I that was, may, I interrupt, I thought, may I interrupt? That was in response, I believe, to your statement last time that the nature of the building and its layout was such that it was cost exorbitant and not feasible to convert it to self storage as we had it written at that point. I think that was meant to be responsive to that. And, and that, I believe that language gives us the ability if somebody can say it's going to cost $10 million to retrofit this building, if you apply the reg literally, and that makes the project no longer viable, I think that gives us the ability to say uh, we'll waive it. That, that, that is not what this says. It says that the commission needs to make a decision as to whether the site and or building conditions make the site unsuitable or infeasible for other permitted uses in the zone. What it's I saying is that there's no other permitted use in the zone that's suitable for this site. I assume your argument would be despite years of attempting to get all kinds of uses, this is the only one 
that is viable. And I guess my reading of that is the financial, again, the cost of retrofitting the building you were saying is cost prohibitive so that the self storage, the one appropriate use can no longer work. So to me- what, what you're missing, What you're missing in this is that there could be another suitable use, okay? That somebody can put there, but it's not the highest and best use. And we've argued, I've seen arguments that say highest and best use means something like a restaurant or something I want, okay? But that's, that's a definition, okay? That appraisers use and everybody uses. But you can say that, well, we could put a car wash there or we could put something else, okay? And that property then goes from being a $2 million asset to a $1 million asset. But with the way this is written, okay? It's saying that nothing else could go there that it's unsuitable for anything else. Well, it's never gonna be unsuitable for anything else. So you might as well just throw this provision out. It's also, may I just say, it's also saying infeasible, which to me includes some level of financial consideration, but beyond that- But, but, it, but it doesn't I, say that, and who's making that assessment? And who makes that determination? Don't, don't forget that. Don't forget the commission that commission make that determination or does the owner make that determination? The, the commission, I think that you have to keep, don't lose sight of the fact that this use is a special permit use, which by definition means it's all subject to the commission in finding that any specific proposal is appropriate for the location where it's being proposed. This is not an as of right use. It's not a site plan review only use. So there's a certain measure of discretion and analysis that the commission has to put on every application for this use. Understood. But I can also say that in my conversations with all the powers that be with former mayors and everybody else that, AJ, if you want to put self-storage, you want to sell, we're not going to stand in your way. All right. And, but, and I'm doing everything in my power to be so-called good citizen and cooperate and try to find somebody else and somebody else that you guys had or whatever. And I never understand why there's such a, an adversity to self-storage. And in fact, when I went to one of the subcommittee meetings that was held, all right, I thought it was gonna be like 12 against one. And what I found was just the opposite, okay? Is that people were asking, well, why does it have to be these restrictions? And why do we not want self-storage and all that? And the, and the onus was put on Peter and Mark to come up with explanations as to why, why there's such a concern for self-storage. And then apparently that's been abated because Peter did a great job traveling all around the state and figuring out that self-storage is not an eyesore and it is a good good use of, of, of spaces. And then for some reason, then we came back to say, well, let's just go with mixed use. And then that's where it came. But, but the question is, if you had a proposal that somebody wanted to put a self-storage facility that was aesthetically pleasing, pass an architectural review, and it was a $7 million project, but it did not require, did not have mixed use, would you say no? I think the whole purpose of D is to allow us to say yes. Yeah, I mean, that, that was my interpretation is that D allows us to have this discussion during a meeting and say, you know what, like this is, this is good. This is an appropriate use of this site. Like, so, because that's that's kind of the nature of these meetings. Uh, no, but what, I, I I get that. What I'm my question, however, was not just with adaptive reuse. My question was if somebody comes in and says, "I want to put up a new facility, seven million dollar facility, but I don't want to do mixed use. I'm not a mixed use person. I'm not a mixed use developer. I am a self storage developer." You tell me what you want the facade to look like. I'll make it the most beautiful facade, okay, in the front of the in front of the building, okay. We're next to a Goodyear, okay, with garage doors, by the way, and but I'll make it look however you want it to look, all right. But I don't want to do mixed use. I'm not an apartment guy. I'm not whatever, okay. I want to build a self storage. And if somebody came to you and it was aesthetically pleasing and it was a seven million dollar project. It did not have mixed use. Would you say no? I guess the question then goes back to Peter, whether 
D should be limited to adaptive reuse of existing buildings or could it be new construction? I mean, so as written, it would have to add some language about new construction and you guys would have to have that conversation if you think that's uh, appropriate. So that revised section D uh, only applies as far as I was intending to the adaptive reuse of existing buildings. So there would need to be some additional Thanks. Hey, look, hey, let me throw my two cents. Why don't we just get rid of two? I wouldn't. That wouldn't bother me. Is that is that a big deal? Get rid of two. D two. The special permit requirement. No site or building conditions make the site unsuitable or, or unfeasible for other permitted uses of zone. Is D two big deal? I thought you want to have some. Yeah, I thought that was the easier one. I thought that would be the easiest one to meet, given the thirty or forty uh, different, you know approaches they've had for the property that at this point, I think you've come to that determination that there's, there's really nothing left in the uh, scheme but, of things for, but for Peter, but Peter, you're missing, I'm sorry to interrupt gentlemen, but you're, you're missing the point with regard to, I could sell this property for a million dollars tomorrow. Okay. But it's not the highest and best use and I'll take a tremendous financial hardship. Okay. And the way it's written to say that this site is unsuitable or infeasible for other permitted uses, you will always find some permitted use that somebody would want other than self storage. Okay, but I'm not willing to take a million dollar financial hardship, nor should I have, and nor would the community want to have a property or some use that's significantly less. That's the problem I have with that. So, so that I think too should be definitely struck from that, and it is a special use permit. And you have a lot of control as to what goes there and how it looks and, and all that. But I think definitely two should be stricken stricken from that. And one, and who's determining if there, the market demand exists? You know, when you all first a year ago, uh, and Peter, you presented it and, and you had some of the statistics right okay, with regard to how many self-storage units were needed per population, but you missed one very important point. It was that you were using the population of Weathersfield, okay? But this, you have to use a three mile radius, but then it's gonna take you into contiguous communities here. And so the man is definitely there. But what happens if we go back and then we do a similar type of market demand analysis that you did previously, which was inaccurate, okay? And now, you know, okay, and then that throws that out too. I mean, so nobody's going to put in a significant amount of dollars without knowing and studying and knowing that the market is demands there. Why would they do that? I, I think we're trying to be real estate developers in all due respect. Well, actually, to tell you the truth, the person that would could do that is the guy maybe 400 yards down the street for you and says, geez, I'm going to put. 10 self storage units in the back of my building just to make a little cash on the side. Do we want that or not? I, I don't know. You, again, you're a special situation. What about the guy 100 yards down from you? What if a guy comes next week and says 100 yards down from you and says, I'm going to put these in? And, you know, that's what, again, 3D was trying to, we, I think Peter was trying to make that for you. And a guy, I, I wouldn't have any problem getting rid of two. I'll be honest, I wouldn't have any problem getting rid of one. Just roll three into the one paragraph. I'll be asked myself, but. Well, know. I think that makes the entire regulation useless. <laughs> no, you but still have uh, mixed use requirements. It's just that we yeah, may that we modify can, it. We can waive if the buildings are nice. <laughs> I think you could, right? I don't know. No, I mean, what's the point of having a regulation then? You should have an architectural review. That's what many, many towns and cities do around the country. They have an architectural review. And to see, I mean, you have this special New England use permit, right? And you can make a decision. Does it fit or doesn't it? Isn't but, part, but, part one and two, like that's just like general discussion that we have on so many permits that come ahead of us. Like we talk about the market demand and we talk about, is this location suitable for X, Y, or Z business? So, I mean, like, like that's the whole crux of a lot of the conversations that we have for many yeah, but that, I, I, I get that, Ryan, but that's not what this is saying. 
It's not saying. I'm just saying I don't want to get rid of the like one and two because those are just. I, 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 I know, but what you're saying and what you're commenting on, okay, is not how I'm reading this. And I don't think how it's intended to be read. It's not asking, is that site suitable for self storage? Because that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about is that this exception, this may modify exception to the proposed new regulations is only a possible exception if this site is not suitable for anything else. It's just the opposite of what you're saying. It's the trigger by which this exception could possibly be considered. This may modify exception, okay? What it's saying is, it's saying the inverse. It's saying that this exception doesn't kick in unless this site can't be used for anything else. And this site can always be used for something else. I could sell this high, I could sell this tomorrow for a million dollars or a million two or a million three. I could sell this literally within a week, I could have this sold. Okay. And there's gonna be something else for there. Okay. That's why this doesn't work. That's why two doesn't work. It's not saying, do we want to have self storage? It's saying that in order to trigger this exception, and I don't even know if it's an exception because it says may modify. This is may. To me, may means also may not. It doesn't say that it should say that these, you know, these uh, mixed use, I don't even think there should be a mixed use requirement. You know my feeling on that. And the self storage, I don't think the, the multi-story should have anything to do with the existing properties at all. So I don't think it should say may, it should be not applicable. And I don't think number two works. I know it doesn't work because you could drive a truck through it. And what I'm concerned about is that, that the drafting of these regulations, okay, that this is really a smoke screen and maybe it isn't, okay, but that's what I'm concerned about is that the intent and the good intent of the commission trying to do something to be accommodative, but that this is actually a smokescreen because there's always gonna be something that's unsuitable, that, that this site could be suitable for. So I'm never gonna be, can never prove number two. Number two will never happen. You could always, if you wanted to find something that will violate number two and thus make number D inoperable. And I don't know why, I don't know why mixed use is such a big thing. Why does it have to be mixed use? I know I would like to propose the question again. If somebody had a new development, they were going to do a $7 million cell storage, new construction, but it did not have mixed use. Would you approve it? AJ, uh, this is Mark Trahan, um, and we'll let the commission um, think about that for a moment. I think at the crux here is that we're ruling in, and you are ruling out, the idea of mixed use with a storage facility. As you know, the initial intent on the moratorium was to potentially rule out self-storage. And after listening to you, and as you've said, taking into some thoughtful consideration, we reviewed other things that were happening uh, project-wise in this area and nationally, and came back and found a way to rule in storage facility in its highest and best use, with, which would include mixed use. And as you know, um, you and I and Peter had a conversation several months ago with a company that was considering that was a developer of, of uh, storage and also was interested in two other pad sites on that spot, incorporating a restaurant and another business, completely fulfilling what we were talking, what we're talking about here. Um, that was a, an item that you and I discussed in Peter with the actual developer. So no one is ruling out storage here. What we're saying is for us to rule storage in, we feel the highest and best use would incorporate mixed use on that site. And again, if you look around the country, that is the hottest craze right now with regards to self-storage. And you could look at the periodicals that come out, and I provided several of these to the members of the commission, articles that have come out just over the last six months that are talking, that is the wave of the future for self-storage. 
So what we're trying to do is to accommodate your needs on that property. If you feel as though over the 25 years that you've owned the property, um, that you've had a hardship there, and I know you've had 25 or 30 deals go through, uh, fall through, I'm not sure what the symptoms are on why all those deals are falling through, but the idea is we're ruling in storage with mixed use. We're not ruling it out, we're ruling it in. And we're trying to find a way to help accommodate what you're feeling and what we feel is the best, highest and best use for the property there at 1000 South Dean. And that's the gist of this. There, I, I think it's a regretful thing to say when it's a smoke screen. There's no smoke screen here. Initially, our intent was to rule out self storage on, on any properties in Weathersfield, but we have been very flexible and try to be very patient with you as well, as we've tried to understand why you decided not to market the product, uh, your project or your uh, parcel nationally to get people from Georgia or Chicago or, Mod or Moderna, California or whatnot that are in this particular arena of building these mixed use storage facilities, get that site out in the public so you can get those phone calls. And we're hoping that those things come. So uh, just to recap, I think we're, we're finding a way to help rule in storage, not rule out storage. Well, Mark, you know, I, look, I, we can go around and around on this, but it hasn't been 25 or 30 offers. Uh, we've had half a dozen proposals that potentially were serious on this. Uh, the property is marketed nationally, so I'm not sure where you're getting your, your data from, but it, well, my, just interpret recently... my interpretation of what my interpretation of what you said is basically that I should be happy that what was once permitted and then subsequently taken away and now given back as only partial of what was originally uh, permitted that I should be pleased that I'm left with half of what I had before this whole process began. Okay, because self storage was not, was not prohibited. And so by taking it away, I lost everything. And now you wanna bring back half of it potentially. So, I mean, let's just call it what it is. And I'll be happy to sell it to you if you want to buy it. Maybe I'll finance you. But, you know, to put so many restrictions, I, I really would love to hear if the commission would entertain somebody building a new facility there that did not have mixed use. And it was a $7 million facility. What would the commission do? That's a fair question. Was it always, it was the mixed use wasn't part of it as of when? Like when when was it okay to be like full just storage facility? Like what was I that date? The moratorium. Yeah, right before the moratorium. Like what, what was that date? Oh, a year ago. September so before that, before that it was full, it was like you, you could be like just nothing but storage. You could do mixed use. Uh, we didn't prohibit that. Uh, for example, the, um, uh, cheap, cheap storage facility up on the uh, Berlin Turnpike, not a shining example of mixed use because it has a pawn shop and then it has uh, the old style uh, garage door uh, self storage units. But that is a, is a uh, mixed use because it has commercial as well as self storage. So uh, self uh, mixed use was permitted uh, previously, although it didn't specifically say that, but by uh, previous planning and zoning commission action, you did allow uh, mixed mixed use up there. So we have one of our one of our three projects in town is mixed use. But mixed use was never required. Mixed use was never required prior to the moratorium, which still wasn't. But this is the first proposal of mixed use being required. Right. This is this is the first time that something fell through because potentially of the of the mixed use. Correct. Prior to that, it was deals. Correct. Right. Just so that we don't get completely out of hand, is there anyone else in the public that wishes to speak on this application? Doesn't look like it. Okay. Peter, when does the moratorium expire? Uh, December five or six. So you have a meeting on December one. So we have one more meeting before the um, moratorium expires. I have a question, a quick question anyway. Peter, with all the work that you've given us, I've gone down the uh, 
from Fairfield County into New London County and seen some enhancements to some of these storage facilities. I've looked at the trade journals that Mark gave us and some of the other detail, having been in the uh, appraisal profession for over 40, 43 years. Um, AJ, if this was saying that the Board of Commission had the discretion to look at that 50% to maybe 30% or 20%, I'm asking this question because when you go to the Berlin Turnpike and you look at a rear lot with a rear storage facility that doesn't have the frontage, doesn't have the exposure, doesn't have the highest and best use potential for your site, would it, would it be something that we would look at differently if we had some latitude on that 50% ratio? maybe with the frontage and having a different density as a different purpose? Because I'd be surprised if the other three facilities aren't before us in the next year asking for enhancements. What I'm seeing in Darien, Stanford, Norwalk are facilities that have some residential use, to be honest with you. There's a couple of them that have put apartments in for the management team to take care of those dysfunctional lots where they put storage facilities on that have a lot of visibility, a lot of exposure to I-95, to the Boston Post Road. They've been really plums for some of the apartment dwellers that are intensely occupying mm -hmm. some of the facilities, especially with people leaving New York coming into Connecticut. How could you answer that question? And might it be more marketable by having this promoting a mixed use facility at some discretion for the board? That, that's an excellent question. And to my knowledge, look, I'm not a developer, but I do have the reliability of those who are developers who are interested in this site. And so uh, I had an open mind, right? I took the regulations as proposed and I passed them out. I emailed them to a few of the developers and it was pretty harsh. The comments that I got back, you know, this is ridiculous. This is, a, this is not the market. And I'd be more than happy to you know, I, I, I'm in a position to to monetize a property I have. I'm not in a position to say it has to be this or it has to be that. I'm just going by what the market is saying, right? And uh, and so, and uh, I'd be happy to share the names and, you know, and Peter and Mark, and you guys could have conversations with them directly. Uh, but it seems to me though that the, uh, apartments, for example, take apartments. And I think, Peter, you had one example that had apartments to it. But it was primarily an apartment building. And then it went downgrade. And they did a very creative way of taking advantage of that downgrade here and were able to put in self storage to take advantage of that. But it was primarily an apartment. Um, I don't know, and nobody has approached us, and this is nationally marketed, uh, and, uh, and it's on LoopNet, and we are getting probably, I don't know, I'd say two or three uh, serious inquiries a week that are coming in on it. And How long have you had the property listed on LoopNet? We took it off once the deal, once the moratorium went, okay? And so I just thought we were wasting our time. And when this commission was meeting again to address, and Peter and I have been staying in contact, that uh, this meeting was gonna come up or the November 3rd meeting was coming up. Uh, so about a month prior, we knew it was coming up. So then we put it back up. And, you know, and uh, we didn't say this is only self storage. We just put it back up. And, and so I'd be happy to share the list of people who have inquired, right? But just last week, there's a gentleman, uh, he has a fund out of Canada. And, you know, he said, this is, this is what I want to do. And I said, look, the commission is very concerned. This was after you all met the first time we all met. They're very concerned about aesthetics, about how it looks and how it mixes with the community. This is, a, this is a prime thoroughfare. There's 23,000 cars a day going by and it's very important. And he said, I understand 100%. I can make it look however you want it to look. They will not be, dis they will not be disappointed. And so, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I think that's part of the reason that there's been an objection 
correct me if I'm wrong, to the self-storage is because of its potential appearance. Even though this is, you know, we're next to a garage, we're next to a Goodyear, all right? But it would look very aesthetically pleasing. You saw one of the, somebody asked me what was that last, or asked what was that last photo that I had on the memo that I, the response I had to the original, you can see, uh, you know, that company had a drive-through, which is a garage door, but it was a drive-through climate control, but it looked like a Porsche showroom. You know, so there's ways to address this. And I don't, I don't argue or disagree at all if somebody was proposing building orange doors on Silas Dean. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have that approved either. But I don't think that's what anybody's talking about. I, I think if you have the authority, which you do, to have an architectural review to see if it's somehow aesthetically pleasing and whatever the words that can come up with that make it make you all feel comfortable that is visually and aesthetically pleasing and consistent uh, with the neighborhood, then that's probably all you really need. And if somebody wants to do mixed storage and mixed use and you say, all right, but I'm going to give you something else in addition, if it's mixed use, because for some reason we may want mixed use, then maybe they'll do it. Maybe they won't. I don't know. To go back to my original question, AJ, and how long you had the property marketed, you know, I've been involved with the, with, with economic development the NRDA now for, I think, seven or eight years. And I think during that period of time, it's been on LoopNet for maybe um, a couple of months uh, during that period of time. And we, we had, I, Mark, we had a, a real estate agent. Uh, unfortunately, he, he passed away from esophagus cancer. But uh, Peter, maybe you remember, we've had some meetings with him. Uh, we were there and somebody brought us a... Um, uh, somebody that wanted to do out of Hartford, the Hartford, uh, a lighting company, Connecticut Lighting or somebody. We had a meeting right in the uh, town hall and, uh, you know, and Paul, our broker was there. Uh, I've had three different brokers over the years represent us. Uh, so it, it's not without trying. Why would I not want to try to get this thing, what, get this property sold? There's, there's, there's no, there's no incentive. There's no reason why I wouldn't want to have it sold. I, I would agree with you. And I, I think the point to make AJ, and especially if you're getting two or three calls a week, you know, storage is, we're talking about storage here, but storage is, is one of dozens of things that could go on that site. And we're talking about this because the, you know, we feel as though that a storage facility with mixed use would look the best and highest use for that particular business. But I think that if now that you've begun to aggressively market it on a national basis, I think you're going to get a lot of phone calls because We've had it for the last two months, Mark, marketing aggressively on a national basis. Okay. You know, again, you know, we're saying what we think, what we think. Okay. But the market is what's determining this. You know, you know look, if I had somebody, if, if all these calls were coming in and I can't wait to do mixed use, fine. But I'm not getting that. Okay, and you know you've been aware of this property for so long. I, I don't know if you brought me anybody that could potentially uh, Mr. in here Mr. either. Chairman George Oichel here. Both of these people and this particular owner has had his say tonight. I think we hear him, and we may do something with this. But this is a hearing on the application. Uh, I do have a question. What would happen if somebody came in? with only residential or came in only with business and storage or actually came in with neither of those, would we be able to accept it? Well, I think it would depend on whether it's permitted by the regulations. Well, this set of regulations, Mr. Chairman, would we be able to accept it? Who would not be able if they to- they came in, not residential. Right not residential, alone. I'm intrigued that, AJ, you're getting any calls with the economic pandemic environment we're having. There's a lot of commercial businesses, a lot of commercial owners that are looking twice and seeing what's gonna happen in the next six months or the next three to four years. Yeah, that's, that's a very accurate statement. And um, um, 
and uh, we're doing projects in the millions. Uh, I have a $28 million project in Indianapolis uh, that is outdoor retail. Uh, everything's getting hurt across, across the nation. But I will say though, I wouldn't use the word recession or pandemic proof, but I would say the self storage is recession and pandemic resistant. And uh, when I looked at the numbers that uh, there's still a high driver because there's a need for self storage and it's not so affected by other uses. Uh, I mean, uh, hotels, uh, you know, our, our, forget it. We did have a hotel group that was potentially interested, uh, but they're in a lot of hurt right now. I'm dealing with a national company uh, that just took back about 20 hotel properties. Uh, that's really hurting. Retail is, is, is really hurting. And you're right, 100%. Uh, everybody's sitting, you know, back on the sidelines. Um, but, you know, even before this, though, I can just say there hasn't been a, a lot of, you know, a lot of potential here, but the self storage, uh, it just seems to be somewhat resilient. And uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, we've heard from the owner, we've heard from Mark. Um, nobody else in the public wishes to comment. I guess we're kind of at a point where we have to do one of limited number of things. One, um, you know, if, if we are comfortable with the presentation that Peter has put together, um, you know, perhaps with a couple minor amendments, we can close the hearing and approve it. If we don't like what has been presented to us, we either continue it to the next time and see if we get something better or deny it. Um, if we are going to, you know, send it back or continue it, I think we need to be very specific about what it is that we're looking for because, um, you know, time is tight in terms of um, the expiration of the moratorium. And it's not really fair to anybody to, to just keep kicking that can down the road um, while we contemplate this. Um, you know, I guess the, the first option of, you know, taking what has been presented maybe with some minor changes and approving it. I guess one of the corollaries or caveats on that could be that if, you know, someone were to come in with a $7 million project that was entirely self storage and a new building, um, you know, that that project could come in with a text change proposal that was designed to do more than what 3D does to um, allow us to make that happen because, you know, frankly, as much as we want to, um, you know, adopt something that works that helps preserve property values in town, um, you know, where, where there is a legitimate business purpose and where it's in the best interests of, you know, the town, the property owners and, and the regional economy, I, I think we've got a history of being very willing to listen and act on things that, um, you know, move the town forward. So I'm not, I'm not trying to push the commission in any one direction or another. I'm just trying to push us into doing something other than staring at each other in little boxes. Um, I think you're right, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I understand completely what you're saying. We have been flexible at making a change. Uh, and that can happen in the future. And I wouldn't want any ZBA to come in and say, hey, you have that ability. And once in a while, they do things that they're not supposed to be doing and try to make a change on this that uh, may accommodate it. Uh, so uh, I think we can move on. We've heard quite a bit at this hearing about what we should be doing and uh, we can discuss it further. Okay. Anyone else have any thoughts on how we should proceed? I guess I, I think I'm comfortable 
proceeding tonight, but I guess just to echo Rich, what you said a little bit earlier, if, if the consensus is that we want to retool something that has to be done, you know, can't be done on the fly tonight, I just think we should be very careful considering the remaining timing, because if we were to get to the next meeting on December 1st and either deny the proposal or not be comfortable voting on it, and the moratorium expires, then, you know, we're, we're it's basically just back to where it was and uh, everything we've done for all these months is kind of out the window. So I guess what I'm really saying is if we're not going to act tonight, if we're not comfortable acting tonight, I think we might want to consider some very brief extension because I know that has to be noticed as a public hearing and we could probably do that together with the continued public hearing on this and just have it as a safety valve. Um, plus, if we act on December 1st, I'm not sure if there's enough time for Peter to publish in the newspaper and have the effective date all occur before December 4th. So we ought to consider that as well. Well, well under the executive orders, you can publish on the website. So you can do that okay. the next day. Okay. But but I'm, I think I've heard enough to try to address things tonight if other people are comfortable. Okay. Anyone else have thoughts? Can I ask again why the 50% was in there, Mark and Peter? Um, why not 30%? Um, we, we did research other communities. Um, I can't, you know, specifically recall which one, but um, we looked at a whole bunch of different samples from all over the place and we tried to apply them um, uh, specifically um, not to not to AJ's property, but to a typical, so a typical um, self storage facility these days is a, about the 90 or 100,000 square foot uh, type of project. So if you apply the 50% um, ground floor uh, requirement, so for example, the one up on off of uh, off of the Berlin Turnpike and Arrow Road is was 90,000 on three levels. So it was a 30,000 square foot fr uh, first floor pad. So the 50% rule there would be 15,000 square feet of commercial or residential, just to put it in perspective. Um, on the, <clears throat> in the multi-building concept uh, with the 25% of the total floor area, uh, if you go 25% of 100,000, um, that's 25,000 square feet. So it, it just, puts those numbers in perspective. So we didn't um, just necessarily pull them out of the air, um, but there are other examples where they use those numbers. And we felt uh, given the math that we did uh, in these examples, it, it would work. Um, and actually uh, when Mark indicated that there was a proposal or, or an idea for this site for 1000 Silas Dean Highway that had two pad sites, uh, the 25,000 square foot number actually works. So we spent some time working in Newington. It'd be a whole different discussion if we we're talking Costello Road, Stem Road, or some of the other industrial parks there and stuff. But again, we're not focused on one property, looking for the benefit of it all. Mr. Chairman, I respect what you said about the text amendments that we might be listening to in the future. Um, so yeah. I'd like to float the boat and move this thing along. Okay. Tom? Tom, did you have something to say? Your box lit up. Oh, no. I'm, I'm, I guess I would just uh, echo what I seem to hear uh, other members of the commission uh, indicating. Uh, I basically find the, uh, the, the proposal as submitted uh, reasonable. Uh, there could be some, some potential tweaking of uh, perhaps uh, a couple of spots, but um, you know, from my standpoint, I'm prepared to act tonight. Okay, thank you. All right. Anyone else? Um, I guess. Can I, can I, this, is Dave, this is David. This is David Just, just yep. add my thought process to this thing. Based on these, sure. these, this documentation. 
we can only do two facilities that size the highway in the whole town. That's all you're going to be able to do, two of them. And if 1,000 comes in with a seven, eight million dollar deal that's not mixed use, it seems to me 3D takes care of that. I again, I, I I'm happy with the whole write-up. I, I would think 3D takes care of this whole issue. Uh, we need to cover ourselves for the guy a hundred yards north of him doing something smaller. But I, I, I just don't. I think we're covered. We're allowing two to come in on Sisson Highway, and if he comes in with a big deal that makes sense, it's attractive. 3D takes care of it. So I, I think I think we're good. But you know. Okay. Thanks, Dave. All right. Anything else? We seem to be heading toward closing the public hearing. Is there anything else before we do that? Is there a motion to close the hearing? Motion to close the hearing, Mr. Chairman George. Okay. Second? Second that. All right. Uh, motion by George, second by Mike. Any discussion? Uh, if not, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Joe, were you opposed to closing the hearing? Okay. No, I was a, I was an aye. Okay. You're on uh, tape delay. All right. Um, in light of that, does someone want to make a motion to uh, start discussion here. I guess for purposes of discussion, I would move that we approve the proposed amendments as written, um, subject to to one um, modification that I would propose, which is to impose some type of limit on the uh, sort of bonus height and density that uh, can be allowed for a mixed use development but just for discussion purposes uh, i'm going to suggest uh, i don't know 10 or 20 percent uh, how about, about 10 percent just to get something out there um, and then uh, I'm also going to propose, I guess, a, that we modify the 1500 to, to 2500 in terms of separation distance. Okay, so just made a motion to approve the draft regulations with the change that the uh, 1500 feet separation district distance be uh, changed back to 2500 and that item P on the last page four uh, that the increase in building coverage and building heights be restricted to an increase of 10% over what is ordinarily required by the regulations. Second is there a that. second? Uh, Mike Vera, second. Uh, I'll second. Yeah, Joe. Okay. Yeah, Joe, I, I agree with you on P. That was, that was a little... Um, too open-ended and I didn't that a waiver that that, that was that open-ended and indefinite really would withstand scrutiny. Um, Thanks. I'm, I'm open, you know, if anybody has thoughts, whether it should be something other than, than 10%. Why, Joe, did you want to expand to what, 2,500 distance? I, I guess uh, it doesn't seem to me you know that it that it harms anything, and I guess it's just out of concern that uh, you know that that we that we might you know I'm just not 100% confident that the 1500 is as uh, achieves the same effect as the 2500. So I guess my thought is why uh, you know if it's not going to cause any harm, why not just go with the higher figure? And as I said before, if somebody petitions to change a zone of one of these intervening properties to match an adjacent zone that might affect the measurement we, we could change it back in the future right if necessary or something like that right. but this also would preclude too many 
of these sites in the town by expanding to 2,500 too. So I don't know. Okay, I hear you. Thank you. Can I add my thoughts on the 2,500? I, my original thought was the 2,500 also, but considering that you could probably only put two inside the highway, no matter what you do, 1,500, 2,500, the 1500 does give you a little bit more flexibility on what spots down that street. Considering we got one right at the north end, then you got to go 2500 feet south a half mile. And that uh, precludes anything between those two buildings that you could do this with. So it does limit you. But I think what Joe is saying is that it doesn't make a difference in how many potential. No, it does make a difference because between that north, north one and a half mile down, you can't put anything. Can't do it. But but no matter what you do, you can only do two. Again, maybe it's a stretch with three if you get one at the very end. But uh, but I'm 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 good with the twenty five hundred. To be honest with you, but just saying, my, my thought is fifty hundred does give you more flexibility on what site what sites could actually do that. Either way, you're only going to get two. Right. Yeah. That's. I'll throw another what if. If a guy next week comes in and comes down 2,500 feet south on the side of the highway and says he wants to do it, I think he just took the 1,000 out. Can't do it. 1,000 side of the highway. On the north end of the South Street Highway? Well, you got to go 20, you know, on the north end of the side of the highway. You come back down a half mile and you put some guy pops one in there with. 10 units in his backyard. No, you shake your head, that wouldn't happen? You can't do it. The zoning up there does not uh, have either the RC or the BP. So you don't have to really worry about the, the one on the north. Um, the 2,500 feet on the Berlin Turnpike would allow um, one of those vacant properties close to the Rocky Hill town line. Um, I mean, Newington town line, sorry. Uh, oh, it would make it, it'd be close enough? Okay. 2,500 feet, you, there'd still be room up there. And there would be room um, somewhere if, if you did something at 1,000. So there would be room somewhere down at the Rocky Hill town line on the south end of the South Sea. Okay. Those would be the two options. Okay. Well, again, I'm, I'm going with the 2,500. I just said you get more flexibility, 1,500 wouldn't be, but that's, that's fine. And we can always change it, Dave. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. So, yeah. so the only other conversation you should have is the uh, point that AJ made. If you had a developer who wanted to just come in and build a new building, a, a $7 million new building, and all he wanted to do was self-service, a uh, self-storage, that would not be under this proposal permitted. So you should, you should just have that conversation to make sure you're okay with, with that. Or do you need to change the regulation to accommodate that? Yeah, actually, that was the, the only other point that I was going to make was did anyone feel that they wanted to, to do anything with D or do we think that that creates, you know. Again, you're saying a new building because 3D does say existing buildings. It, it's yeah, is that three, right. that really is. 3D is exclusive to existing you know, retrofit of buildings. But if somebody wanted to tear something down and put up just self storage, couldn't do it. Yeah. Do it right now uh, without coming back and changing the regulations or going to the ZBA for a variance. Well, do you think anything like adaptive reuse of existing buildings or of an underutilized site would? allow a new building to go in without, you know, only in places where, you know, there is a higher and better use? Um, or do you think, you know, professionally, we should just leave it as it is. And then, you know, if someone comes in with a $7 million building, we revise the regulations to allow it. Yeah, I wouldn't know how to write that or define underutilized, you know, that's a, uh, yeah. that's yeah. a term that I is, um, 
probably subject to the eyes of the beholder. Um, <laughs> Unlike anything else in a special permit application. Right, right. Um, so it would probably have to be another section. Okay. But then you're almost undermining the entire, you know, intent of this proposal as it's written in terms of the mixed use and the multi-story building. So, um, but as you say, someone can come in if they want to do something and ask to amend the regulations. Yeah, or or if, or if you know, property owners hear from people that we would come in and do something if the regulations allowed X, Y, or Z, you know, we can be responsive to that in a kind of a more less rushed fashion. Yeah, doing it that way by having someone come in and, and propose, you know, uh, a, a, a new section to these regulations if they are adopted or to amend these uh, regulations uh, and, you know, write out in the appropriate regulatory language, what they are actually proposing the regulations be is uh, something that we've handled before. We've had a number of applications in the past where uh, uh, people have come in, applicants have come in uh, having uh, prospective projects and they've uh, proposed uh, the regulatory changes in order for them to uh, make a subsequent application, and that seems to be uh, a reasonable way of handling these kinds of uh, exceptional sorts of issues. You're right, Tom. Yeah, I mean, and, and frankly, the the nature of what there's a market demand for is constantly evolving. So if we tried to guess tonight what somebody wants, you know, during year five of the pandemic, we'd probably be guessing wrong. Yeah, five of the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, who can who can tell what other you know some other pathogen is lurking out in the outland somewhere in the world that can uh, come and strike down uh, humanity? Remember, you know the COVID nineteen is just one of a recent series of uh, uh, of of, of uh, serious diseases that have come. Uh, sort of you know, out of the blue, so to speak, or out of the you know out of the jungles uh, to strike at humanity. We've had SARS. We've had. Uh, All right, how we how we doing? Is this, is this uh, part of the discussion here? <laughs> Can we just? So, so <laughs> we, my point is, we it's hard, difficult to make those kinds of predictions. All right, and, great. Uh, we 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 need to you know look at things as they are and as can be reasonably predictable given you know today's ability to have foresight so let's yeah. move this question mr chairman yeah i'll hang some garlic and we can move it along <laughs> um does anyone else have any, any suggestions or amendments that, that they'd like to make in addition to what we've already discussed i just have one uh peter sure. and rich i think we need to set an effective date as part of this and uh, I guess my question to Peter is what 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 date should we set that gives you adequate time for all your publications and so forth just so you don't get cut short I, I think Denise is uh, on on the line here she may know more specifically about when the next um, legal ad opportunity is Denise can you chime in Um, I would probably pick a date um, sometime towards the end of next week. Yeah, don't forget next week. Next yeah, week probably everything closed on Thursday and Friday. Right? Probably, yeah, towards the end of um, the following week, then whatever that yeah. calendar date is. Let's see here. Just November twenty seventh. Well, Mon Monday the thirtieth. Does that work? Yeah. Okay, Monday the 30th. Let me just take a quick peek here. Because I think town hall is probably closed November 25th and 26th, the Wednesday and th actually the Thursday, Thursday the 26th and Friday the 27th, right? So 
and the December, actually, if you made it towards the, um, the end of the first week of December, it still goes under the, under the moratorium. So if you wanted to go out that far, I just don't know when the deadlines, the, the deadlines for printing the legal notice have been pushed around because of those same holidays. So, um, the end of November, you mean, Tara? So yeah. I, would, I would maybe say December, uh, December 3rd. Well, you still can publish it on the website and have it. Yeah, I guess we could do that and you can cover it. So yeah, we could do it. So then the, the timeline is less restrictive. Yeah. You want to say December 1st, just so you have two business days after Thanksgiving, but not push it to the brink of the expiration? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. All, sure. right. All right. Anyone else have any comments, questions, discussion? Um, do we all understand what the motion is? All right. Um, Motion's been made and seconded. All in favor, say aye and raise your hand. Aye. 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 Okay. Dave and Tom said aye. Their hands are invisible. Um, anybody opposed? Okay. Oh, no, I'm not opposed. Uh, anyone opposed? I already had my hand up before. George. Okay. All right. Any, anyone opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, motion carries, thank you. All right, next item is the new public hearing application 2059-20Z, uh, Eleknor Hawkeye LLC, seeking a special permit in accordance with section 52H6 of the Weathersfield zoning regulations for a contractor's storage yard at 61 Arrow Road. Um, is there someone here who wishes to present on behalf of the applicant? Yes. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yep. Could you just please give us your name and address for the record? Yes, absolutely. So my name is uh, Dan D. Dominicus. Um, our main address is uh, 1395A Tallinn Turnpike, Manchester, Connecticut. Okay. Thank you. All right. And tell us what you propose to do. So we uh, we are a utility contractor um, for Eversource. Uh, we are seeking approval for use of the special permit of contractor storage yard at 61 Arrow Road facility. Um, a little background with us: we were we're a contractor for Eversource, like I just stated. Um, so we do storm emergency work throughout throughout the nation um, and Weathersfield. The 61 Arrow Road address would be our satellite location for storage of vehicles. Um, we have an office trailer um, material. That's where our guys would show up in the morning. It, um, it effectively, we have about, I wrote a list here. We have a yard in Manchester, Weathersfield, Newington, East Hartford, Salem, to name a few. And these satellite yards provide us with um, better access to the community, serving the community in a, in a faster response in storm events. Um, or just regular repair and replacement of the electrical lines. So uh, this this uh, permit and application that we're seeking approval for at 61 Arrow Road is again, a, a storage yard for our vehicles, equipment um, to better better serve the community in a quicker and a faster response time. Located right next to the Berlin Turnpike gives us access to kind of disperse throughout the state pretty rapidly and quickly. And uh, we, uh, we're hoping that we can move forward with this and continue to stay at this location um, and continue our working out of this area. Okay, so you're seeking a special permit, but you're already there? Correct, yes. We were notified that uh, we would, this, we were notified about a month ago by the town of Weathersfield when we applied for a temporary electric permit um to decommission our generator that's on site and we were notified by the town that we need to apply for a special permit to use this this area that we lease okay can you go into a little detail um on the assuming we're are we asking questions yet sorry did i just jump in Yes. Right. 
Anyway, uh, a little bit of detail in terms of the activities, um, specifically either like late at night or first thing in the morning, you are relatively close and according to the site plan gonna be even closer to um, some residences. And I know in the past we've had some discussion about the, the various crossings, whatever the Tinsman and, and the like. So if we can, if we can define your activities early in the morning, headlights through trees, noise, just uh, just sort of lay that all out just because it's it's gonna be part of the discussion later on. Yes, absolutely. So uh, a normal, a regular day, seven or five days a week operation, we, we would arrive at site between 6.30, 6, 6.30, and we leave site by seven. So there's approximately, right at this time, we have six or seven guys showing up for that site, six, six in the morning, um, they'll fire the truck up, trucks up. Um, the noise in the morning would be the backup alarms if we're moving vehicles around, which is required for us to have on all our vehicles um, in compliance with DOT. So that would be your morning. And from seven through, through the rest of the day, we're off site, um, unless there might be a general foreman or another foreman doing paperwork in our, in our mobile office trailer that we have. And then to conclude the day, we would come back around three o'clock. Um, same thing, your noise would be the backup alarms of our trucks. They would have a debriefing of the day and then we'd move off site. And now that's a normal normal day operation. I can't give you exact days when we might be there in the middle of the night. If there's a storm event, that's all weather depending. Um, I know the last couple of days we had some high winds and storms and they were there a little earlier than that. Um, if we're in a hurricane or we have other other high, high stress storm situations, we could come one, two in the morning to to get a better start on the day. But again, that is, uh, I can't really give an exact one that could be because that's all depending on the situation as the time prevails. Thank you. Does anyone else have, uh, anyone else on the commission have questions for the applicant? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Okay, George. Ah, uh, see. You got portable toilets out there, sir? Yes, sir. Why, why don't you have something a little bit more substantial in, in building? You have, a, you have a building there that you have uh, your office in, right? Yes, correct. We, have, we, have, we rent uh, Office 107R is our, is our office for uh, project managers and general foreman. And we, we have access to those to uh, the bathrooms in the building. And we do use the, the, the porta toilets outside for, for our workers. Um, one to not track mud through the building and it's, it's a quicker access for our work being right there um, on site. Are you going to do anything to improve that in the future, you think? Uh, we do have, yeah, we do have a couple trailers um, we've been bringing throughout the site that are, they're more of a, they look like a cargo trailer, but they're just, uh, fitted with uh, bathroom storage, a little more pleasing to the eye than the blue blue storage units that, that could be put on site. Um, but outside of that, that would. Um, okay. How, how about paving of that site? The existing site is paved, you know, within the regular area, but your area is not paved. Why? Um, that, I can't speak too much to that. Uh, that would be the, the owner uh, of the property uh, or the, the, the business park, um, I guess would have to come up with that decision on to pave or not to pave. Okay. Um, I know with the equipment we have, it's a, a, having it stone and screeded, it can easily be um, repaired and replaced rather than um, asphalt. Um, if we were to damage it with the, the trucks or the poles or the trailers in the yard or the dumpsters as well. The poles particularly, probably. Uh, yeah. 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 And, uh, now, I hear you, but uh, the thing is that site has been improved dramatically. I've been around this commission so long that I remember when that was a dirt site at the paved part of it to the uh, oh. south of you. And uh, uh, and also the fencing there amazed me going up there and seeing it today because there was none there at one time around the whole site. So you have it around your end of the site too now, right? Correct, We have they, uh, they provide us with a fence, one for security, um, for our area with uh, the amount of tools and equipment that we keep in our, our, our area to keep away or to try to have a better secure situation for our equipment. Um, but we moved in, in in May or signed a lease in May, moved in in July. So I can't 
tested too much what had happened before. Well, well, you know, I know, and I'm not getting to that. I'm just saying it's a, an improvement. And also the neighbors and the condos to the uh, north side are uh, uh, screened by that, that uh, fencing along the north side. So I think that's important compared to the old days. Are you going to have boats on, uh, stored on site, you said? Or you have one there now? No, 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 sir. We, uh, our, our is, we just have our utility trucks, um, trailers, and poles. I noticed there were some, some emails with some other pictures, but that would be in the, the other part of the business park that has nothing to do with it. How'd you say you were electricity or plumbing? Uh, uh, electrical contractor, so a high voltage contractor for Eversource Electric. Yeah, no, no, I don't mean what you do. Oh, you oh, oh. On site, uh, your buildings. Uh, I guess it's, just, it's there now, or, or you have in where? We we have a we have a mobile office trailer there now, and we we run a generator to power that right now. So we were if you're are you referring to the electrical department? Yeah, I guess that's about what I'm getting. I think you've answered it. And then the yeah. portable toilets outside for the guys, and, and right. in your office or in the you know you got you got the regular toilet. Um, uh, let's see. I think that's about it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Quick question. Else? Yeah, quick question. Hey. Gen quick question on your generator. Does it run all night? And what kind of decibels is it putting out? Do you know? Uh, I do not have an exact decibel rating. And yes, we, we do run it through the night to power the, uh, we have uh, some lights. Uh, depending on, sometimes we have storm work at night and we'll leave them on. Um, but I guess on a regular day, a regular 40 hour work week, we, we shut it down. Um, and I do not know the decibel reading, but part of the reason we applied for our electrical permit was to, to get rid of that. the generator and be more of a silent operation. Okay, it just did, I, it's located away from the residences, but I, just according to the photograph, if that's a generator in front of the building, but just sure. that, would, that would be a concern to the residents nearby. Yes, that, that's associated as far away from the residents as we can have in our area that we use. And overall site lighting, you don't have anything on poles or anything that, from looking at the photographs? No. Uh, yeah, so it's just only your, your truck lights or what lights it up at night? Correct. Okay, thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Tony? Uh, Dan, could you tell us how many trucks you'll have on the site? Uh, right now, I, I can't attest to exactly what's there tonight. Um, on a daily basis, there'll be six bucket trucks. Uh, we have two utility pole trailers, uh, one real trailer, and that can change day to day. We're a unionized company, so if there's more work, there might be more poles and more trucks. If there's less work, you'd see less trucks. Uh, during the day, you you probably see. What you can't really see, they're usually behind the dumpster and the fence, all the employees' cars. They park along the, the fence inside our area, and then they take the bucket trucks out for the day. A normal day, normal week, six six large bucket trucks, a few trailers, maybe a couple pickup trucks, depending. With approval, do you think that, that uh, number of trucks might double? Uh, most likely not, due to the fact that we have uh, yards scattered throughout. Um, I can't attest if it if it will or when it will, like I said, if, if we get more work or there's more work provided by Eversource, those numbers might go up a little bit, but uh, that's that's been our crew size with that crew that operators that operates in that area for the past year or so. Is it likely you'll be registering those trucks for the town of Wethersfield? Uh, most likely not, no. Uh, all, all of our vehicles uh, are actually leased. We lease most of them, again, because of the unionized company that works at fast pace. So if the, if the work's low, all we have to do is return the lease rather than um, having the cost of a vehicle. Um, you'll, you'll probably mostly see them registered out of New Jersey, um, sometimes Indiana if they're leased. Um, but New Jersey and New York are the most common license plates. You'll see one, our main office is out of New York. And two, New Jersey is uh, where we lease the buckets from 90% of the time. Okay. 
if they're here for 60 days, they should be registered with the tax town of, of Wethersfield. So that, that would be my recommendation. And for uh, materials, on your, on your letter, you do reference the storage of materials. Are you talking um, sand and gravel type of a thing or what type of materials would you have there in addition to the trucks? Uh, so materials would be uh, wire, overhead wire for the poles and utility poles, wooden utility poles. Okay, thank you. How often do you have poles delivered? Uh, we probably have a delivery once a month. Maybe we uh, we store. We usually get a truckload, which comes with thirty poles, which most of the work, unless broken poles, the poles are become more of a stockpile of material to just have in emergency situations. Okay. All right. Would you have Anyone a problem if I make a recommendation on any approval that uh, the owner of the site pave your area, even though you said it can dam be damaged by those poles? I still think uh, that it should be. Uh, and then uh, would you have, I would, would like to be able to make a suggestion that won't be part of the conditions. Uh, of approval uh, that you make every effort to have your staff there uh, not be doing backup lights if possible by the way you pull in there and park at night uh, for, for the early morning startups because we do have residential units just beyond the fence line there. Okay. Yes. Uh, but, uh, I, as far as the paving, I'd like to see it done in a couple of years. I'll probably put that as a condition. I hope okay. he won't be too damned upset. He can always come back, come in to see us if he wants and argue with us if he wants. But uh, Fair anyway, those are my thoughts. Okay. All right. Anyone else on the commission before I open it to the public? All right. Um, if not, is there anyone in the public that wishes to speak on this application? Mary Ron, unmute yourself. Wasn't sure if that was you or me. Um, yes, I'm Mary Rom. I live at 10 Tanner Crossing in the development right to the north. We don't have any problem with Eleanor Hawkeye, the, the vendor. The continuing problem that we have is with the owner of the property. Um, we, the lot where they're parked right now, where, where all of this equipment is, didn't even exist a couple of years ago. And the paperwork that was submitted, um, the letter from Russell Road Properties is full of inaccuracies and, and just fiction. It talks about the North lot, um, like this lot has always been there since 1965. That's kind of what they're implying. And that's just not the case. That lot, that lot of two years ago, less than two years ago was grass. Five years ago, it was all wooded um, and they cut the trees down in there. So there's no longer the um, wooded, wood buffer to the North, you know, fate, um, abutting our property that there was before. But more to the point, there's 172 homes in that neighborhood and in, in the crossings. And we have to, the only way to get into the neighborhood and out of it is to drive up and down Russell Road. So we can see everything that's in that parking lot. And, and um, Mr. Urkel was right. They did put fences up and, and they've made an effort at screening and everything, but they also doubled the size of the lot to the north. Like that lot did not exist before. And just this summer, suddenly there was a lot there. There's gravel in there. Someone else tried to apply to park trucks three years ago, I think, um, a bunch of box trucks out in the lot. And this commission set a bunch of stipulations for approving that. And among those would have been paving the lot at a minimum. Um, they had to, uh, there was drainage. Let me check my notes, sorry. Um, had to include adequate screening. And that's part of your, the town code right there that it has to be adequately screened. 
we can see those bucket trucks in that gigantic trailer next to the office trailer from a mile away. And those trucks are parked at night with the buckets up in the air. And it's my understanding it has to be that way. But you can see those through the trees from the crossing side. You can see them up and down Russell Road. It's really unsightly. We, we are concerned about our property values in there too. Um, you said they would have to have paving, lighting, landscaping, drainage, um, that no vehicles could be maintained on the prem maintained in the sense of no maintenance because there was concerns about oil or gasoline spills on the property. Um, the owner at that time, apparently you, you have met with him, said that he was not going to pave the lot, but he agreed to pave the entrance area to the parking lot. The only lot that existed at that time was the one that's directly north of the 61 Arrow building. So when you look at that gate, it's everything to the right. Where they are now on the left just didn't exist before. So I don't understand whether, you know, the zoning, this application, I, the letter that came with it from Russell Road Properties says that the rear north lot was always an open lot used and occupied for vehicle material and equipment storage since 1965 when it was first built. And then it fenced area now occupied by Eleanor Hawkeye LLC was as it is now a parking lot in which contractors equipment and vehicles were stored. That's just a flat out lie. That lot did not exist until a couple of years ago. And I sent um, an email today that showed Google Earth pictures of um, satellite photos of the lot from two years ago. And you can tell the time frame for that photo, those series of photos, because the 7-Eleven down on the corner of Arrow Road and the Berlin Turnpike is open for business with cars in the lot. And that's just in the last couple of years. And you can very clearly see that that whole area had grass on it before. That was never used for storage. There was never anything parked there. There were trees and then just an empty lot with grass cover on it. So there's a lot in the letter from Russell Road LLC that's just, it's plain and accurate. And the boat pictures that went with the other thing was just to illustrate that this owner, I mean, I know the property's changed hands again, but I think we all know it's the same guy because it's based out of Ridgefield and it has a post office box right next to the last owner's box. So, I mean, we're obviously dealing with the same man. We've been through this back and forth several different times. I've lived here 20 years. I can't even tell you how many zoning meetings I've been to over that time because he's always trying to get away with something and pushing the boundaries of, you know, he gets his hand slapped, then the lot gets good for a while. And then slowly there's like mission creep again where you turn around and it's full of things that shouldn't be there. In the, in the original lot, he's got a camper in there, boat in there. There's all kinds of other things that aren't supposed to be there. The lot's not entirely paved, there's gravel there. So, I mean, there, it, there's a whole series of issues. This isn't about Eleanor Hawkeye so much for, you know, at least for me, it's, it's about the continuing non-compliance on the part of this owner. And if you say yes to him for letting them park these vehicles out there and use that lot for contractor storage when it didn't even exist before, how do you control what he does with that lot when Eleanor Hawkeye isn't there anymore? I mean, we have to live here. Those bucket trucks stick way up where we can see them. You know, it, it, it's unsightly and it has something to do with our quality of life that, that I don't know what trailer it is. It's next to the office trailer, but that thing is gigantic. You could half again as tall as the office trailer and you can see all of it over the fence when you drive by. So the whole concept of, you know, screening from the road is, is ridiculous. You can see it from the road. And this letter from Russell Road um, properties also says that the lot, you don't have to worry about drainage on the lot because nothing drains into the lot. I sent another photo from Russell Road. There's no storm, storm drain anywhere near that property and the road actually does tilt toward the property. So water does drain into there. So, I mean, that was a condition last time for when you wanted him to pave the lot and he didn't. So that's it, rant over. Okay, thanks very much. Um, does anyone else wish to speak on the application? Joan? You're mute. 
Good. Um, hi, I'm going to speak. I'm a resident um, in the area at um, 62 Tinsmith Crossing, and um, I had gotten. Just give us your name. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Joan Silverio. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm at 62 Tinsmith Crossing. Um, I had gotten a, a letter from, um, uh, I'm gonna speak once for Carol Murphy at seven Tinsmith Crossing. Um, she had sent um, an email, she, she couldn't come um, and then speak for myself. And so this is Carol. Um, my name is Carol Murphy and I live at seven Tinsmith Crossing. This parking problem has gone has been going on for years and I happen to be right adjacent to this property. Since summer, these trucks start to leave every morning at around 7 a.m. The noise of them backing up and arguing, there is al um, also a construction trailer park there is annoying. At around 3 p.m. they return and all summer I have to go inside from my deck because the noise is so horrendous between backing up, parking and loud shouting. This is just the utility trucks that also have the lifts going up and down. This is the largest entry into this continuous noise problem. On any given day, there are approximately 30 to 50 vehicles parked in any of their lots. I have lived here for over 30 years and it gets worse every time. In addition, these heavy vehicles are causing road issues. I now have to look at these vehicles as the line of sight keeps encroaching. They are continually cutting down trees and expanding the parking areas. So now it is may, uh, many parking lots and keeps getting worse, not to mention louder. I strongly oppose this ongoing expansion of parking lots. This has been going on for years, but recent expansions seem to be uh, more of a problem for me. With the trees being removed, there was a property buffer, but I now have their back spotlight shining into my bedroom at night. And the recent storm has taken down two of their trees that fell into my property. Um, and just, she's 72 years old and recuperating from major surgery. Um, so that was Carol. And now for me, um, you know, Eleanor Hawkeye says that they use this as a lay down area yard, um, which from what I understand means that all the items are in active use on an offsite, you know, on offsite projects um, during the day. But the mobile office trailer with the electric hookups and the portable restrooms seem to be permanently on the site. They don't leave during the day. So this is being used more as a permanent storage. Um, and then Electnor Hawkeye says that there are six utility bucket parks. Um, I guess there was some letter that says that there's six utility bucket trucks parked there. But in fact, um, with the storm this summer, there were probably at least 20 to 30 there. Um, so right now there, um, you know, in terms of the material that's there, there are um, telephone poles, material trailer, one wire reel trailer, material dumpster and other material. And I guess my question is, what is to prevent Electnor Hawkeye from increasing these amounts? So I strenuously object um, to, to this um, encroachment on my quality of life. That's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else wish to speak on the application? Sure. Hi. Um, that's just my grandson's name. Uh, my oh, okay. name is Lynn Brick, and I'm at 58 Tinsmith Crossing. And I've lived here for about 30 years now. And I've watched over the years um, the development down the street from me at 61 Arrow Road change little by little. And um, the biggest change was um, recently when, when the trees were cut down that went along the fencing. I mean, when, he, when the owner put up the fence, I thought, wow, that really looks terrific, you know, compared to what it looked like before. Um, but then he started to cut back the, the trees and there's no tree line abutting the property at the top of Tinsmith Crossing. And the woman that uh, Joan just um, mentioned her, her memo um, is probably, you know, is, is very disturbed. And I'm sure the people along the top of that hill are all being affected by it. Um, you know, while the property's changed hands over several years, it's still owned and operated by the same people who have this long history of non-compliance with the zoning regulations. And if the lots approved for 
contractor storage for this application, there's no guaranteed in the future that this tenant would be storing vehicles and materials that are even more incompatible with the neighborhood. Um, the prior conditions for the approval to use the old north lot, as Mary mentioned, and the open field area that's now the new north lot were conditioned on submission of a site plan that included adequate screening, paving, landscaping, and the entire area to be used. Um, a provision of draining and the assurance that smaller trucks and vehicles parked there would not be leaking oil and grass, gas and would not make undergoing maintenance there. And then in 2017, the owner refused to make those changes and said he'd paved that part. Um, the, the old lot was approved for passenger vehicles, not boats and campers and food trucks and other miscellaneous outside storage. It was supposed to be that if somebody rented space inside the building, they had the option to be able to utilize the back for parking their vehicles. Um, you know, there's there's also it's a, it's not another issue, but just the condition of Russell Road and the wear and tear of the vehicles going in and out. Um, the road itself is a mess, and and it's probably going to continue to be that way. I mean, we have a um, a neighborhood that's been here with 172 units, and I understand this gentleman needs to have profit to his bottom line, but he continually doesn't abide by the rules that your committee has set up for him. And he waits and he's very patient. And then he just kind of sneaks in something. And then we have to go back to the board again and deal with this. And I'd like to suggest, regardless of what the outcome of this um, location and, and what, you, uh, what you decide, that, that that area should be monitored um, to ensure that he does follow the rules and that we don't have to continually come back and have his hand slapped. And then somebody that's a, a customer of his don't end up getting what they want. The last time they had a pro we had a problem with a fellow about three years ago, a, a fellow was in there with trucks and he claimed he had a three-year lease, which you know was questionable. Um, he ended up having to move someplace else because they were doing something that they weren't supposed to do. So I'm just very frustrated with the whole thing. And, and we try as a, um, a neighborhood to try and support each other. And I hope you really listen to what we have to say and, and take it at heart. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else? Azira? Hi, good evening. <clears throat> One of the things that I was noticing um, back in the summer and now even you know more prominently is when you drive up Russell Road, all the um, all the stuff that you see now in that back lot with, you know, today I think maybe there are one or two trucks there, but normally there are quite a few more. And at night, recognizing that the bucket trucks need to be up for, I guess, regulations. It just doesn't seem to be the type of vehicle. I mean, if you're having screening that, you know, we ask the owner to put around, I mean, half of this stuff is above the fence. It's up in the air. So you see all the, um, at least half of the trailer and all of these things up at night and it's just not aesthetically pleasing. You know, when you have a car, when you have a small van or something to that effect and it's hidden by, uh, by the fencing, you know, you're not really seeing it. So that is something that, um, I don't know, just is, is sad to see. And it's just not something that we would uh, like to see in our neighboring community. And um, um, gosh, I had another thought here. Um, and I guess going back to another comment that was said earlier, um, I had been part of some of the conversations over the last few years with some other uh, people trying to, um, you know, put their business in that area. And, you know, initially thinking it would be a viable operation, but after thought and, you know, bringing it here to the board, it was not something that, um, you know, that uh, was allowed, let's say. And ultimately, these requirements of paving. Um, you know, Mr. Oikel had mentioned about paving, 
you know, that's been something that's been on the docket with these people for many years. And I hesitate, you know, if we say, please pave it in the next few years, I guess I'll bet you a nickel that it won't get done. Um, because we've been after them to do that for many years and it just hasn't. So, you know, I don't know. Um, I guess I'll just say that um, it's a concern for me to have this company right next door to a, a residential community. Thank you. Thank you. Before you go, could you please give us your name and address? Oh, I'm record? sorry. <laughs> yeah. Lorraine Zera, Z-E-R-A, and I'm at 19 Otter Crossing. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks. Yep, does anyone else to speak? Anyone else? Uh, there's me, Karen Malenfant. Okay, yep. I'm at 81 Schoolhouse Crossing and I'm here to speak against the special um, permit um, because I do have concerns about um, their proposal for, um, it says in their letter that they want to use a mobile office trailer for storm response crews. And I know they're saying that they're only going to have six trailers, but I mean, what does happen when there is a storm? I mean, what is that going to create for our neighborhood and all the, and if, is it going to bring a lot more trucks, a lot more materials, a lot more men, and a lot of disruption to a residential neighborhood? Um, where that lot butts up against all those, um, the, the top of Tinsmith there. Um, and I do agree and with my other uh, members of the community, it is quite an eyesore driving down Russell to go to your home to see all these bucket trucks parked there. Even the six that I've seen, I haven't seen the, the, the 10 or, or plus there, but even the six with their big their mobile trailer um, and the fact that they do have a mobile trailer out there uh, makes me wonder like how much um, more foot traffic um, or other business would be brought in uh, since they have such as a huge mobile office out on the parking lot versus um, the office space that they have in the building. Um, that's pretty much all I have on, um, I think, just going over my notes real quick. Um, those are really all my concerns I have, and along with um, my other uh, community members, I've you know go along with a lot of their concerns also. Uh, that that the noise that they're going to make, and the uh, damage to the road, and that the tenant hasn't um, been doing any of the things that he's the excuse me not the tenant the the landlord of the property. Um, we've had reoccurring issues. Uh, with them, with him not following some of the planning and zoning recommendations, like the paving and things like that. Um, and that's it. Again, with Seth Karen Nalfon from 81 Schoolhouse Crossing. Okay, thank you very much. Does anyone else wish to speak? Yes, um, Martha Arnold. Okay. I'm at uh, 33 Tanner Crossing, uh, and I've been at the crossings for a little bit over nine years now, and. You know, in that time, I have seen, you know, these changes on the 61 Arrow Road property, and they haven't been for the best. And, you know, I lived in New York City for 31 years, so I know all about noise and traffic and trucks. And, uh, you know, I moved to Wethersfield for peace and quiet. And uh, I'm hoping, you know, to continue that in the crossings. And I just want to reiterate our, the concerns of my fellow residents that, you know, there is a quality of life issue here. Um, you know, we've, we have a wonderful neighborhood. Um, we look out for one another and, uh, you know, we're concerned about property values. Uh, the property is an eyesore, you know, going to and coming from the crossings, um, not to mention, you know, the other quality of life issues that have already been uh, discussed. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate you keeping the residents in mind and uh, this community in mind and uh, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Hi, this is Mary Rom again. I had one, I just had an observation for the, the commission. Is it the standard practice for an owner of a property to send the tenant to the commission to ask for permission to do something? Is there some reason, this is what the history is like here. Is there some reason why the 
actual owner of the property isn't here. It always seems to be the case that something happens there that triggers a meeting like this and the owner never shows up. I feel sorry for the people who rent the space out there because they're the poor schmucks that sit here in front of this board and have to answer questions about, well, are you gonna pave the lot or are you gonna do this or that? And it's not up to them to do it, it's the owner. So where's the owner in all of this? It, you know, it's, it's just an observation. I've been to enough of these meetings for that property and that's the one thing in common to all of them. And that's all I have to say. Thanks for thanks for hearing us, though. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, and, and not to be dismissive of your last comment, I mean, quite often when it's a tenant that is applying to do something, you know, regardless of who the owner of the property is, the tenant is probably the one better able to explain, you know, the nature of their business and operations. But uh, you know, as, as you pointed out, I mean, and it, and it happens all over town, quite often tenants end up being the unintended recipients of uh, observations, comments, criticisms, and so forth related to the, uh, you know, the landlord and the site as a whole, um, you know, and, and frankly, sometimes we've been kind of put in a dilemma of, you know, do, do we do we punish the, the tenant for what the landlord has done somewhere else on the site? Or do we, you know, walk a fine line trying to figure out some way to, you know, to allow the tenant to do what they are applying to do, but at the same time, you know, create some kind of meaningful pressure to achieve compliance or remediation from the landlord or owner, you know, elsewhere on the site. And it's, you know, it's not a perfect situation, but it, it does arise frequently. I mean, and then there are some cases where, you know, the owner is, is wise not to appear. Um, Peter, one of the comments or one of the recurring themes was basically how this, you know, North Lot sort of manifested itself out of nowhere. I remember Three to five years ago, Rich, could you, you know, when there was a prior app? Hey, Rich, back up a little bit. We, uh, you kind of went in and out there. We didn't hear the question. And if it keeps happening, maybe turn your video off, and you won't lag as much. Yeah, it says I'm unstable. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but how's your connection, though? Yeah, really. <laughs> Other than that, yeah. Um, it, it was basically that, um, you know, th there was some discussion about how this North lot sort of appeared out of nowhere, um, you know, a few years ago when there was another application, you know, we went by and it was kind of like, oh, wow, all the trees are gone. And, you know, the conclusion we all came to at that point was, well, you know, they can cut the trees on their property, but you know, then then the site was modified to put parking where grass had been, where now there's, you know, a dirt lot is, you know, is I, I know we've had a, a lengthy um, enforcement proceeding against the applicant. Is there anything pending or are there any you know, outstanding permits that weren't obtained for this lot or, you know, is it just kind of, it is what it is? But I think the neighbors described it uh, very accurately. It's been this creep over the years where, um, you know, it's quiet for a long period of time and then they'll cut down the trees. Um, then it'll be quiet for a long period of time. And then, you know, there's a gravel parking lot and some fencing and um, then business shows up. So. Um, <clears throat> whether it's by design or, or, or uh, some other method, uh, just one of those continuing things with this property owner. So the fencing um, does not require a permit. We don't regulate um, fencing and don't require a permit for that. So um, that part and the tree removal, um, whether you like it or not, does not require uh, approval. Uh, it's when he starts moving dirt around and, and creating parking lots and those kinds of things that um, planning and zoning approval 
uh, is required. And obviously when he uses the property for any specific purpose, whether it's uh, short term or long term, uh, there, there, therein also lies a requirement for a permit. So um, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but it is the, it is uh, unfortunately the practice of this property owner to do it, um, to do it that way. Um, we do not have any outstanding enforcement actions against uh, the property owner, except for the one that's pending uh, in front of you. They were directed uh, by the building department and by the zoning officer to come in front of you and get a permit for this activity. Um, the previous legal um, uh, issues uh, were resolved in court and this owner is paying fines related to that. We, the town won that decision and uh, a decision and a financial um, requirement was applied to that property owner and he is in the, he's in the process of paying that off as we speak. Okay, thank you. And that was related to the truck the trucking the box trucks that box were being parked right. the box. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um Mr. Chairman, I'll I'll speak here at this point if you want, or do you want to continue in some other manner? No, I I, I think yeah. I uh, hey, I'll put up with this site and this owner for 30 years. And I feel very sorry for the people that our uh, residence is to the north. And uh, he incrementally, as we've just learned, does things without permits. And I recommend that we have a complete site review application presented to us and that we, we can't ignore this tonight, can we? But I'd li almost like to. I, I feel very strongly about this situation that he takes advantage of this commission and this town without really doing. I was surprised to see the old parking wow. lot paved and the fencing all the way around, but this new area that was trees were cut down and we had to deal with that a few years ago and so forth. Uh, and the problem it's creeping closer to these people without an adequate review and provision of our regulation. They, they're not following our regulations. For instance, I'm sure there should be some kind of uh, uh, area of trees on that north side or something and good sized ones, things of that nature, Peter. And uh, I would expect that the town would require that and that you would do a, a, a an application. I don't want to deal with this one tonight. I consider this a complaint to us and not an application. Okay. I guess my two cents on it, or I, I did go by there over the weekend and you know I was driving, so I wasn't counting very carefully, but it seemed like there were more than six bucket trucks and they were you know, obviously highly visible and, you know, particularly when you, when you drove down to the first cul-de-sac, once, you know, you, you take a right down at the bottom of the hill, then you're, you know, you're looking up at probably a 30 foot hill to begin with. And then you have the, you know, the extended buckets up above that, um, you know, no, no humanly possible amount of screening is going to take care of that. And, and frankly, um, you know, given the transitory nature of the uses on the property, I think it would be ridiculous to try to put in 50 foot trees to, to screen that site. But um, and maybe this can't be, maybe we can't approve this then, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I, mean, I, I guess my thoughts are one, I was gonna ask why the buckets have to be up. I'm sure there's a reason either right. you know, safety, regulatory, or you know, just operational and second, I think, you know, given the description of the kind of varying numbers of trucks and cars and things, um, I'd like to have a little more definitive site plan as to what exactly. is going on in that north lot, as opposed to, and, you know, and what and we have. Which is, show up with appropriate uh, staffing 
or the site review, technical site review? Well, I mean, I, I guess just basically, I, I wanted to have a better handle on on what what is there, what can be accommodated, because it's exactly. you know, kind of a red trapezoid superimposed on the site plan of the whole site. Um, you know, it looks like it shows five cars and three trucks, and you know, it's clearly more than that, and clearly capable of more than that. There's, there's apparently um, no drainage. I don't like the excuses that that doesn't. There's no drainage. It's a ridiculous comment. There's water coming down everywhere. The town engineer requires all on-site and off-site drainage, in particular these days, and in great detail. So you know this this is a this is just a, a fly-by-night approach here, and it's uh, it's ridiculous in consideration of these neighbors. I'm sorry to be upset, Mr. Chairman, but I've had to put up with this for a lot of a lot of years, as you have, because you have served on the commission almost as long as I have in many ways. So we have uh, we've been through it all. Yeah. So I don't know how the other commissioners feel. I'd like to hear. I mean, I, I I'd hate to to see I hate to see them punished, um, you know, gentlemen before us today, because um, I think a lot of these come back to the property owner. Um, but at the same time. I think we also had, um, we had like more of an engineering discussion with like the, the dog um, daycare property than we are with this one. So, I mean, like, you know, there's there's potential engineering solutions to at least mitigate what's happening. Um, and then there's the, obviously the larger conversation of like the continued use of that Northern section, but uh, you know, just putting trees up, like, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, and, and, you know, to commissioner Vieira's point, it's like, you're, unfortunately you're punishing him but like avenues of making that Northern area maybe a little bit more useful uh, without impacting the neighboring community. Like there, there's potential for solutions there, I think. Yeah. With, with noise walls, like, cause the fencing that's out there, I don't know if anybody was out there, it's like, you know, I'm taller than it. So I figure, you know, if you put something that would be a little bit more robust, I mean, they have, you know, timber noise walls that are like 15 feet high on the highway. So maybe that's something that can be effective here, whether or not that that's pretty to look at compared to what's out there today for the neighboring community. You know, that's, that's what the debate is for, but um, you know, seems like we can put a little bit more thought into it. Okay. Does anyone else have any comments on this? I'd like to hear the applicant respond to some of these concerns. Sure. Yes, absolutely. So I, I noticed a reoccurring uh, question was the buckets um, visible in the air. And unfortunately, pertaining to these neighbors that our safety department, uh, corporate HR, that is required by them to have them up one for safety of, of community or people trying to climb and, and get in the buckets because you can operate most most of the truck from the bucket the other is security of tooling and uh, the machinery that's inside the bucket keeping it up up in the air at that height um, prevents anything from being stolen which is, has greatly happened in the past uh, another thing about uh, the paving in the yard I, I i wish i could speak more to that as that um is that how that yard was put together was before I became involved in this situation, unfortunately, and I wish I knew more and, and I wish I could do more. Um, but unfortunately that I can do what I can on, on that, on that note. Um, and then the equipment, I, I know you guys want a, uh, a more accurate statement of what is there. And uh, I, I apologize for not, having a better uh better number as in vehicles as it, it just it varies 
it greatly every day, whether it's people coming in, whether the work is there, whether it's raining out at all, it, it's a variable. Um, like today, I know there's probably three or four trucks and, and I'm sure there's been three or four times as many. Um, and we can certainly, um, moving forward, we can definitely disperse that and make it not a, uh, with other places we can go without getting rid of everything there, but we can, if that's a main concern about the amount of vehicles traveling on the road, we can, we can work with our other yards and our other, um, employees to, to see where we can disperse these vehicles, um, the best we can while still being able to operate out of that yard. And I know another another question was about our, our mobile office trailer and we call it a mobile office trailer because that's what we we put on site to site or, or show up to show up whether it's a, a parking lot like this or off in the woods somewhere on, on, a, on a, a project through the trees um mobile office trailer seems to be the term it doesn't leave with the crews that is correct uh, we, we i think inside there there's a there's fold up chairs a fold up table and a, and a printer and copier for our general foreman um, which we have three of, and those are really the only people, one, allowed to use all of that, and two, that would ever be in there. Um, in the morning on rain days, uh, everyone's required to come in. We'd have a job briefing whether we're going to assess the day, and that's somewhere where we go to have those meetings because it is bigger than our office in the building. And, and to be generous, the other tenants in the building, we're not tracking mud and, and crews of people through, through their building to get to our office in the building is just a computer desk for more or less project managers or engineers working working on computer it houses about two people on computers compared to where that that office our mobile office trailer out there um, is for the crews and, and, and the workers themselves and then the the tall trailer um, that can pro that can be addressed the tall trailer is where we keep bolts cones safety equipment uh, road signs any, any other type of materials other than poles and wires that we may use, consumables, you could call them. Um, it's a whole bolt. That's, that's our mobile storeroom. So in, in Manchester office, our main, our, our main Connecticut office has an entire storeroom with shovels, any, any safety equipment, anything that's for that office in those trucks in, in that big trailer is for all that equipment. So show up to show up. All you have to do is hook the trailer up and, and go to the next show up. Um, and we can move quickly and, and get out of the site quickly when need be. But during the time we stay there, that is, that's our storeroom for materials, any, any consumables or small products. I think I cover If there's any other things I missed, I tried to make notes of everyone's concerns about the property and, and touch base with everyone um, and get them the best answer I can give them based on the site. Okay. Thanks. Um, ask the commission where do you want to go with this you know, do we want additional information or if so what mr chairman I, i've expressed myself as to what i think we ought to do so okay i'd like to hear from the property owner um mr chairman yeah. I am. Uh, we've got uh, quite a lot to deal with in this uh, piece of property, and have had for uh, you know well over a decade now. Um, and it does yeah more than 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 certainly more than one decade now. And uh, I, I tend to think we need uh, one of the things that we need before we would act upon this application is. A, uh, a a report uh, that would detail uh, the various uh, you know compliance issues, the uh, past determinations and conditions that have been imposed by uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission is applicable to this property, and what the uh, status of uh, uh, of compliance with those conditions are you know, over the, the lifetime of various enforcement actions and applications with regards to this property because our only our only means of, of uh, control over really what happens here is when an applicant brings an application that we have to act upon or we are requested to act upon 
and I don't think that we're able to exercise that kind of, of authority uh, in an informed way without having a full and complete uh, uh, you know, uh, history and, and status uh, with regards to uh, the past uh, efforts and actions and requirements as it relates to this property. So I would I would tend to think that we we would need that you know, you know, a, a full and complete report before we would consider this application. So my own feeling is that uh, we should uh, delay um, uh, making any decision with regards to this application until we have uh, you know a, a complete report. I guess just to to clarify. Would you be looking for a complete report of just what is kind of current and outstanding? I mean, for things that are, you know, applications that may have been approved or denied in the past that are no longer relevant, um, you know, or, or no longer active, the, the Enforcement Act uh, action that's been, you know, concluded or just the the currently applicable requirements and whether or not they're being complied with? I would tend to think you could limit it to uh, uh, current, uh, you know, current applicable requirements as it relates to uh, the ongoing use of this property by the owner and other parties with whom the AI the uh, the owner has a, a relationship with such as the applicant in question. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that made sense, you know, rather than war and peace about everything going back to 1965 here. Yeah, well, no, that's, the, no, that's, that's I'd say, you know, where, where applicable and where relevant. Yeah. Okay. What, George? Yeah, I just wanted to say, even though I said we've had difficulties for 20, 20, 30 years at this site with this owner, he has done a good job on most of the site at this point. I was, in fact, impressed with the fencing and the upkeep of the front part and the building and all of that. So we don't want to need to go back over what happened in the past. It's yeah. just mainly this new end of the site and maybe some aspects of the existing situation there, but mainly it's that at the end of the site that he's asking for, that they're asking for tonight and that it appropriate uh, requirements such as drainage and paving and, and uh, any, any uh, security for the neighbors or anything like that uh, should be addressed. So, you know, those are the things we have to get a handle on here rather than the approach that we have received tonight, which is an explanation of what's, what's there. It's really not, it has no dealings with paving, drainage, or any of the things that we normally require of an applicant for a site. Okay. Peter, do you have, do you think you have enough guidance from this discussion to be able to work with the applicant and or the owner to come back with something? Yeah, I, I think the thing to do is for the town engineer and myself to meet Dan out there on the site, uh, kind of look at it from the neighbor's perspective and also look at it from the inside of the uh, parking lot and, and come up with a, a list of things. I've got a uh, long list of notes um, that I think will uh, also be factored uh, into that site inspection. So uh, we'll try and set that up. Uh, I assume you're going to continue this to the December 1st meeting or, or thereabouts. So we can set up a, a time to get out there um, as soon as we can and, and get that get that in motion. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's where we're headed. And, you know, given the holiday and so forth, if it you know, gets bumped off to the meeting after that, you know, so be it. It's just I wanted to make sure that you had some kind of sense as to what people were talking about. Tony? I think I do have it. Yes. I'd like to ask Peter to also include the number of trucks maybe that would be limited on that site, the actual location, maybe you have it lined out 
with or without pavement. But more importantly is to have six trucks or 12 trucks capped out and registered, declared to the town of Weathersfield as taxable. If you're bringing in 20 or $30,000 of revenue for these trucks to be in the town, you should at least have that, not have it go to Manchester or have it go to Kentucky. Okay. Uh, does anyone else have anything that they want to um, weigh in on before we we make a motion to continue this to December 1st? Can I ask a couple of questions before you continue? Sure. Um, as far as I'm probably jumping the gun ahead of this, but let's say hypothetically the special permit gets approved for these trucks. I mean, how is there like there's nowhere, nowhere, no way to police how many trucks or the traffic or anything that they're going to be generating. So there wouldn't be really any recourse for us as a community if we notice that, you know, one day they have 12 trucks or there's a big storm and for an entire week they have trucks and they're only permitted for six. Is that correct? Or how does that work? I guess it comes down to what what the conditions on the approval are as far as you know how many trucks would be allowed and I think before we get to that we need to have a better handle on what you know what's there what the site can reasonably accommodate and so forth and you know and for better or for worse um, you know town staff can't be everywhere so um, right you know, if, if hypothetically it's approved for six trucks and, you know, you routinely see 18, um, you know, you let the town know. So that. I know I'm just, I'm concerned, not because of the, the, the tenant. I just think of the past history we've had with the owner and then the owner, you know, has now sold it to a, a third party who, so that now he just manages it and it's just, he just has a not a very positive track record in our neighborhood um and that's so it just concerns me of you know if it does get approved you know what else he could do um on a different note um my last question is since this permit it needs more information to be decided on everything's left in limbo until the next meeting and the trucks can stay there until the town decides where you're how you're going to move forward on the special permit yes okay yeah i think that's accurate okay i have a question on uh so are we when we had the other property do uh like a noise analysis that was on the owner right that's something that they did because you know we're we're talking about the difference between two trucks and eight trucks and from a disturbance point of view, you're not really going to appreciably notice much of a difference between the two. Like, yeah, you're probably going to get like some of the base level. So like, I would appreciate somebody weighing in on like what our options are in this kind of case, because, you know, we've had, in this case, it was a dog uh, property where it was just like the difference between 20 dogs and 40 dogs, you don't notice. The, like, but the, like, is because there's like those outlier and that's going to be like the backing up or, um, you know, certain operations that are happening like on, on the site. So, you know, I wonder if we're getting into like the more you encroach towards a neighborhood without conferring with us, like the more you need to do to mitigate all of the, um, all of the uh, disruption that you're causing. So, like if there's any other engineered solutions that need to happen because, you know, this northern section, like I don't know what the outcome is going to end up being, but it seems like it's still going to be in use no matter what. I, I, guess, I guess I would just want to make sure that we're having like a noise yeah. discussion along with a use discussion. And as he noted the um, noise, I've noticed that I've looked at the site plan. They'd come to us originally. We approved this. If they had opposite handed this site, so the trailer, tra constru the construction trailers and the mobile trailers were the backside and the trucks were to the backside, 
they visually wouldn't have been seen by the road that much with their extension up at the, you know, the poles, the poles were, were st stored by the road. I mean, I, it's probably too late to do that, but if this was laid out differently, it would be less of an eyesore from the road, I think, with the trucks. Yep, and sometimes, sometimes common sense works and sometimes you need a noise an analyst to, to tell you what's the best option. Peter, that should give you about three pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've added to my uh, collection, so. <laughs> to your lengthy. Okay. Um, is there a motion to continue the hearing to December 1st? Motion so made. Second. <laughs> All right. Motion by Tony, second by George. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Thank you. Um, next item. Minutes of November 4th. Motion to approve, Mr. Chairman. Second. A second. Yeah, there was a second. Joe, second. Joe, Joe. Second. Joe. Joe. Joe, yeah. Okay. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? All right, thanks. Uh, and next item, staff reports. We've punished Mr. Morrison long enough. We'll let him take the floor with the fence regulations. You're muted. You're muted. Muted. Still muted. Okay. All right. Good night, everyone. So um, <clears throat> we're here again with the uh, proposal for the change in the fence regulations. Um, myself, Peter, and Derek met uh, a couple of weeks ago, and um, we decided to kind of um, throw out the original um, one that I brought before the board, before the commission. So it was our thought that um, it was probably a little bit too uh, long and drawn out so we have um kind of um condensed it into what we have now um so we have um we have section 7.2 fence regulations then we have an a section with um three subsec four subsections then um uh b section with which speaks the fence on corner lots and visibility at intersection. And then we have a C section, which is speaking about um, no permit being required for a fence and what uh, fence in the rear yard could be. And we also spoke about vegetation and shrubbery that could create an unsafe situation. So that's what we have um, here in front of the commission tonight. Um, we, I also made a suggestion that um, the title that's in the, on the website that says application guidance for installation of fences, be changed to guide for installation of fences. And it's simply because um, there's, no, there's no application as such for fences. Um, it's just a guide for the installation. And then um, there are some recommendations which we, which I propose that we keep those recommendations. Those are those four uh, fencing suggestions. And um, also under guide for fencing installation, 
I would also like to take that last paragraph that says, additionally, a retaining wall or freestanding wall or fence or other structure not complying with the above provisions may be exempt from the front yard requirements. We want to take that out of the regulations because it would already be covered uh, by section B on the front page of your um, document. So that, that is what we're proposing, Mr. Chairman, and um, I hope that we can um, move forward with this new proposal. Um, there's just one other thing. The, uh, yesterday, the, um, the engineer, the town engineer made a suggestion that we just kind of modify that last sentence in section B, which I'm sure we can do and it does make sense. He also suggests that we move it and it, to the first to the first section that would be under section A. My my humble opinion though is that we could keep it, we could change the wording, which is which makes sense and keep it in the same B section. But um it's left up to uh you know suggestion what we want to do from here on. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Does anyone have questions? The chairman appears to be clear and right to the point. Peter, do you have any comments? I have a few little tweaks, but we can work that out once we um, put a final draft together and get an application submitted so that we can um, get the process going and um, get this in front of you for a hearing at some point in the relatively near future. So, uh, but no, in, in uh, concept and in uh, principle, uh, I think um, the effort to simplify it, keep it relatively consistent with what we presently have and just tweak it a little bit is, um, is the best, uh, best approach. Um, we sat down with the town engineer, uh, Charles and myself and, uh, took the previous version and, and you know, modified it significantly. So I think this gets us gets us um, very close to the mark with some minor uh, revisions, which I'm happy to work with Charles on and get that back to you uh, in relatively short order. Peter, this is for installation of residential zones only, right? If I want to read in the first sentence. Um, yes. Well, let me just. It's in the, it's, let me just see this. It's in section 7.2, which is, um, that's a good question. Um, so it says installation yeah. of fences, but it doesn't say residential fences. It says, right. And it, yeah, it doesn't say commercial either, so. Yeah. yeah. Um, this, this section is typically speaking to, um, to residential fencing, yes. Yeah. I think that should be in the title. But you raise a good point that it, if we may, we may want to not apply it to commercial, given obviously yes. you had an example tonight. This, uh, well, I don't know what the height of that fence was, but um, so, so that's a, you make a good point that we probably need to talk about and just mm. clarify that. Yeah, I mean, I think this is just general performance standards. So probably it, it applies across the board then. So we may, we may need to be mindful of whether we need to tweak it as it relates to commercial properties or have some exceptions or something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, we probably possibly could just have a, you know, kind of a caveat at the end saying that, you know, in commercial and industrial areas, the commission may impose such other requirements as, you know, may be appropriate for the, for the site. Sounds good, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Good. Thanks very much for your efforts on this. Okay. And um, before, if there's no other comment uh, before we proceed, Mr. Chairman, I just like to bring up a point of interest here um, regarding the zoning board of appeals application that we have received. Um, I noted the um, email that was received that was sent out today and um, 
I do apologize for not bringing this to the, to the commission's um, attention before. Uh, however, um, the zoning regulation section 10 F4 speaks to the fact that prior to any action on a use variance, the zoning board of appeals shall submit the applications for such use variance to the planning and zoning commission. Uh, and any report submitted by the commission shall be read at the public hearing and be part of the record of application. Okay. I, I, I felt that we, we could go to the board of appeals and then the way all the regulations is written and then the board of appeals would um, make a submission to the zoning commission uh, before any action, but maybe it should be the other way around. We should have brought it to the zoning commission first and foremost, and then um, the zoning commission would submit a report if any to the commission, and then the, um, the commission would act on that and um, come up with a conclusion. Um, I'm just throwing this out for uh, discussion, Mr. Chairman, as to how we proceed from here. And um, I will make it my point of duty that any other zone um, use variance that comes before the Zoning Board of Appeals, we make the appropriate submission to the Planning and Zoning Commission before it even gets opened in the Zoning Board of Appeals. No, I, I, I really appreciate that. And I mean, that was something that was added in the regulations, I don't know, 15 years ago. Um, and it, it just kind of was overlooked consistently. And I think, frankly, the only, the only time that we had a, an issue with it was with the, the car dealership on Knox Street and the Berlin Turnpike. Um, you know, because it came to us basically as a fait accompli where all we could do was, um, you know, count the cars on the site, you know, and not weigh in on the use. But um, it was something that because of circumstances long before you were here and probably before Peter was here, um, you know, we had some issues with use variances. So we made a specific point that at least having it referred to planning and zoning for you know some kind of feedback as to yeah that makes sense in that particular zone or you know are you insane um you know somewhere in the in the spectrum between those two things um you know just basically getting a temperature check from planning and zoning um, understanding that the ultimate decision still rested with the ZBA, um, you know, was something that we wanted to have. And, you know, it, it was, it was the kind of thing that since the vast bulk of the variances have to do with dimensional things, um, you know, having it, having it as a checklist, oh, this is a use variance. We've got to do something different with is something that, you know, none of your predecessors had on their checklist either. So it, it's not like, um, you know, it's, it's anything particular to, to your tenure. Um, but I'm, you know, I, literally somebody asked me last night, you know, what's the sign for, um, you know, and I looked it up and said, oh, it's a use variance, gee. <laughs> you know, so I think, you know, just, when you get an application for a use variance, you know, sending it to Peter to include in the packet for the next meeting. And if we have anything to say about it, you know, it'll, it'll get back to, you know, get back to you to go to the ZBA for their hearing. Um, you know, and again, ultimately it's their decision, but it is, you know, something that we had consciously put into the regulations because of instances in the past. You know, for example, I think at one point, almost all of the drive through windows in town were use variances um, rather than anything that was regulated. And there were a couple other situations where, um, you know, there, there were uses that were consciously not permitted in certain zones and then magically they would appear. So uh, it was something that we had purposely and intentionally put into the regulations, but um, it happens rarely enough that it 
just kind of fell through the cracks occasionally. Yes, Mr. Chairman, and I would also like to mention at this point too that um, that property in question, 105 Marsh Street, um, it was actually approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals. The parents was approved by the Zoning Board of Appeals in 2016 for the property to be used as a, a church, a public assembly in an agricultural zone, just for the records. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and we didn't, <laughs> and the use variance wasn't referred to us then either, so. And, um, and the point is that um, the, it was not filed on the land record, hence um, it was, it became null and void, so they have to return to the Board of Appeals, just to give a little oh, okay. history on that. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Mr. Chairman, just one other thing to bring to your attention. I got a phone call from the uh, Weathersfield Country Club, uh, the recent um, storm uh, and the uh, you know period of time that it's been up the uh, screening and netting uh, at the driving range um, is some of the poles I think have actually deteriorated to the point where they need to replace um, many of them and then put up a new um, new series of net nets to keep the uh, the uh, long hitters or the <laughs> where the sh shankers or I don't know what the other term is in golf um, from hookers. hookers. I, yeah. Thank you for setting me up on that um, <laughs> from um, going into the neighborhood. So um, the building department is going to require some engineering in terms of wind loads and how deep the poles are going to be. Um, I didn't necessarily view it as something that has to come back to you guys because it's really just, in-kind replacement of nets and poles with obviously new equipment, but I wanted to mention that in case there's some strong uh, feelings uh, about that. Um, this does not pertain to that one section that was put in without permission in the neighbor. Uh, I believe we, he came came to uh, this commission uh, to uh, express his, um, his concerns about that. Um, it applies to the stuff that exist, existed before. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up and get any feedback I, I could from you guys, could from you guys feel differently than I did or, um, or you agree or not. I think the engineering department so, working so with you on that. that something. To me. So it's just replacing something that had either existed or was permitted or so forth before. Oh, yeah, and we will look at it at the staff level just to confirm that and make sure they're not doing something above and beyond what was approved there before. But um, I didn't, they, they asked if they needed to factor in, you know, visits to the ZBA or the planning and zoning commission. So, um, and that was, as I say, just yesterday. Okay. No, that sounds fine to me. I don't okay. know what anybody else thinks. That means I gotta go out and walk the site out there and I don't wanna do that. To the driving range is clear towards before you go out there. I know. I might get hit with a couple of calls. How many years? If I let them know you're coming, George. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Public comments. There is no public. Um, November 20th development report. Uh, that was included as correspondence. Do you have anything to add to that or? No, I just, I gave this presentation to the town council. Um, fortunately, it was early in their meeting because they were there, I think, until midnight last night. Um, really? So unless you have any questions, um, there's a lot of activity going on in Old Weathersfield, a whole bunch of things. Um, and uh, we got a couple of projects, uh, you know, under construction, the, the um, former Puritan furniture, if you've also been up to the former pet supply up on the Berlin Turnpike that came together uh, pretty nicely. Um, and then I, the rest of the stuff you guys talked about because you've been uh, reviewing and approving uh, these things. So um, yeah, in case you have any questions of, on anything on the list. Okay. Thanks very much. Sure. Oh, no problem. Pending applications. What's 140 Silestine? 140 
Silestine is the uh, pad site at the Silver Cove Shopping Center. Um, many years ago, they had proposed a, another pad restaurant out in the deteriorated part of their parking lot, corner of Jordan Lane and Silestine Highway. Uh, like pad Thai or some other kind of pad restaurant? Just a pad outlying, a pad site. Uh, this, this particular um, restaurant is uh, Popeye's Louisiana Chicken with a drive through Apparently the uh, best chicken sandwich, I guess you can get by some positions. I, I think that's, that's common knowledge. Yes. <laughs> Design review has looked at it already, I heard, Mr. Chairman. So. They looked at it once. Uh, they had some uh, information. They tried a sandwich. They wanted, no, they, they, didn't they didn't come bearing sandwiches. So don't get- uh, don't, that'll, that'll grease the wheels, don't, literally. Don't expect that. Uh, it's going to design <laughs> review, I think, for the second time, either tomorrow night or next, or next week. It'll be um, before your next meeting. Okay. Is it going to be a- an actual restaurant or just a drive-through? They're pretty small restaurants, so it, it yeah. is. It does have some seating, but I think a lot of their business is done through the drive-through because it's only a, I think like a 20, 2,400 square foot uh, footprint. Okay. The only thing Joe Hickey told me, Mr. Chairman, about it, he said was nothing to do with the design. I asked him, did you ask him about that? And he no. He said. They discussed, he said he brought up the right of way around it. I guess he had some concern with that and the intersection around it. I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, that there's a, forth, I know. Yeah, I mean, there's kind of a funky traffic arrangement over in that corner of the site, yeah. but it's basically nobody's ever had to pay attention to it because it's just kind of a sinkhole of pavement for the last 25 years. Right. All right. No, that'll be good. Um, and the other one is Heirloom Market. Yes, this is their um, larger plan. They, uh, if you recall, you approved a uh, liquor permit for them. So as part of that, this is now the, the uh, broader plan of what they want to do with some of the spaces. They want to move some things around and uh, add to their occupancy. Okay. Do you think either of those will be at the next meeting or is it too soon for that? They're, they both would like to be at the next, the December 1st meeting, so. Okay. All right. Does anyone else have anything they want to bring up tonight? I'll take that as a no. Uh, is there a motion to adjourn? A motion oh. made, made. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, George made the motion, Mike seconds. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Thanks very much. Have a good evening. Have a good Thanksgiving. Stay healthy. Mm, you too. Thank you. Happy yep. Thanksgiving. Thanks, all. Happy thanks everybody. Okay. Have a great Thanksgiving. Nice seeing you at a real meeting. I'll say huh? that.